Looking to improve your game? You can now sign up for CFB Pro using the promo code LVD, get access to articles and deck guides by the world's best. Hello, hello, and welcome to this special edition set review of Zendikar Rising for Limited. We've got uh, a pretty busy schedule ahead of us. I'm going to review every single card in the set, including rares and mythics. First off, let's give a quick rundown of every letter grade here. Cards that get an S grade are usually very rare. There's maybe a handful in every set. These are cards that can carry a game by themselves and that don't really need a ton of help to win you the game. Then the A rating cards are still absolute bombs that can easily win you a game, but they don't necessarily do it all by themselves, and they can sometimes be pretty easily answered by removal spells, even if they can dominate a game if they go unanswered. And then the B level rating is definitely for above average cards, cards you're usually pretty happy to first pick. In this category we also have most of the good removal spells in the set that aren't too conditional in nature, so that's typically where the B grade falls. Then C plus are definitely still above average cards, these are often the best commons in the set, or some of the best commons might also fall in the B category, but definitely the above average commons, cards you're very rarely gonna cut from your limited decks. Then at C we've got kind of the major bulk of the cards in each limited set. These are the normal playables, cards you're reasonably happy to include in your deck, but every now and then you might end up cutting them if you need to make some space. And then finally we've got uh, D-grade, which are usually cards that don't end up making the deck more often than not. In this category I also put sideboard cards that in best of three you might find valuable, but uh, are typically not gonna find their way into the main deck. And then the F-grade is also pretty rare, kind of like the S-grade, it doesn't come up a whole lot. These are cards that are completely unplayable in limited and you're just better off putting a basic land in your deck instead. And these are often kind of sideboard cards meant for constructed play that don't really have any applications and limited. So that's just a quick rundown of all the different letter grades. So let's get started. First off I like to take a look at all the multicolor cards in the set as it gives us a better idea of what the different two color pairs in limited look like and what the synergies are like and how we should try and approach those different color pairs as well. So let's reset the vote here and we'll get started with our first card. Akiri, Fearless Voyager, a 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, legendary core warrior at rare, saying whenever you attack a player with one or more equipped creatures, you get to draw a card. And then for single white you may unattach an equipment from a creature you control and if you do, tap that creature and it gains indestructible until end of turn. So that's quite a lot to take in. Just as a baseline, 3 mana 3-3 three, three is pretty solid. Pretty happy to include that in most of my decks. And then it's not too difficult to find a few equipments in this set. There's definitely a pretty big push for uh, these equipments, as we'll see as we take a look at the artifacts. So it shouldn't be too difficult to end up with a few equipment in your deck, making this into a pretty solid rare that can kind of snowball card advantage. And then the activated ability, we can unattach an equipment. So that's going to cost us a bit of mana to then re-equip later. But then if we do, we can tap that creature and it gains indestructible. So it kind of saves the creature from a removal spell or if it's getting in combat it could trade favorably. But of course you lose the bonus from the equipment. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting ability. It's probably better on defense than it is on offense, is my guess. You could still attack and then use the ability once it's declared as, a, as an attacker, because tapping is not part of the cost. So you can still use it on offense, but of course you lose the equipment bonus. But either way, this is just kind of gravy on top of an already pretty solid card. So I'm pretretty happy giving Akiri an A rating, depending depending on how many equipment you can get. If your deck only has like one or two equipments, then of course Akiri is gonna go a bit lower. But if you can prioritize equipment, and most of the equipment in the set are playable, so I'm pretty happy giving Akiri an A. Next up we've got a Brushfire Elemental, two mana for a 1-1 elemental with haste. 
and it can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. So that's a pretty useful ability. And then Landfall, this is our first Landfall card, saying whenever land enters a battlefield under your control, it gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So in Limited it's going to be tricky to trigger Landfall more than once per turn, but there are definitely a few cards that enable that. So let's say on average we're attacking with a 3-3, then, uh, you know, for two mana, that's not a bad deal. And the ability that it can be blocked by smaller creatures is definitely quite relevant. It has haste, so even later in the game, if you still have a land in hand that you were sandbagging, you can potentially play this, play your land, and attack with a 3-3. So Brushfire Elemental seems like a pretty strong incentive for the red-green kind of landfall synergy decks. And I think I'm happy giving this... Maybe not like a, s a full B, but maybe B minus, C plus, somewhere in that range. Definitely an above average card. Next up we have a Cleric of Life's Bond, 2 mana for a 2-2 two -two Vampire Cleric at Uncommon. Whenever another Cleric enters a battlefield under your control, you gain one life. And whenever you gain life for the first time each turn, put a plus one plus one counter on Cleric of Life's Bond. So this kind of reminds you of the Ajani's Pride Mate. The major difference here is that you can only get one counter per turn instead of potentially getting multiple counters if you've got a lot of different lifelink creatures out. But uh, it still adds up and it also potentially triggers during the opponent's turn. So it doesn't limit getting counters during your own turn. And there's quite a few clerics in the set, as you'll, as you'll see. There's a strong push towards the party mechanic, which involves clerics as well. So, yeah, Cleric of Life's Bond, definitely a solid payoff for the black-white deck, which typically has quite a few life gain synergies, and I'm happy giving this a B. Next up, we have... A Grackmaw, Skyclave, a Ravager, 3 mana for a 0-0 Hydra Horror. It's also legendary and it's a rare. And when a Grackmaw enters a battlefield, it enters with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And whenever another creature you control dies, if it had a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, you can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Grackmaw. And when Grackmaw dies, we get to make an XX black and green Hydra creature token where X is the number of plus one plus one counters on Grekmaw. So that's also a lot to take in. I mean, as a baseline, we get a three mana three three essentially with a ton of upsides. So the black green deck does seem to have quite a bit of synergy with plus one plus one counters. So it shouldn't be too difficult to find more plus one counter synergies to go with Grekmaw. And then at the very least, even if you don't have any other plus one counter synergies, when Gregmaw dies, we are left with a 3-3 token. So this seems like an amazing card. Definitely giving this one an A. Next up we have a Cargan Warleader, 3 mana for a 3-3 human warrior and uncommon, giving other warriors we control plus one plus one. So nice lord for warriors. And warriors are also definitely a supported tribe in Zendikar Limited, as it's also part of the party mechanic. So yeah, war leader seems quite solid. Definitely B, maybe even B plus, depending on how many warriors you can get. Then we have Kaza, a royal chaser, a blue and a red for a one-two legendary human wizard at rare with flying and haste, and we can tap Kaza. And then the next instant or sorcery spell we cast this turn costs X less to cast, where X is the number of wizards we control as this ability resolves. And of course, Kaza, a wizard herself. So, yeah, this seems like a solid little card. There's quite a few wizard synergies in the set, as once again, it makes part of the party mechanic as well. And it does help you potentially cast some expensive spells as well. And uh, yeah, doesn't take much for this to generate two or three mana. If you've got a few wizards in play, blue-red, typically the color combination with the highest concentration of wizards. So Kaza seems pretty solid too. 
Uh, I'll give this one B, maybe B minus. Not one of the best Bs we're gonna give today, but uh, yeah, definitely a solid card. Then we've got Linvala, Shield of Seagate. Three mana for a 3-3 three, three legendary angel wizard with flying, saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, meaning you've got all those different creature types, you can choose target a non-land permanent on opponent controls, and until your next turn it can't attack or block and its activated abilities cannot be activated. And you can also sacrifice Linvala and then choose Hexproof or Indestructible, and creatures you control gain that ability until end of turn. So the first part of Limvala, of getting a full party, it's gonna be possible in Limited for sure, but it's not gonna be easy. So we, f we shouldn't focus too much on having a full party, but just a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three flyer with the ability to potentially give the team Hexproof or Indestructible is quite valuable already. So Limvala seems totally great here, and I'm happy giving Limvala an A. Just a fine creature by itself, and it has a ton of additional utility as well. Then we've got a low mages familiar. Three mana for a 2-4 beast at uncommon that taps to add green or blue, and whenever we cast a kicked spell we gain two life. And there's quite a few kicker cards in the set, so... Yeah, the familiar seems great. A 2-4 is a decent blocker for 3 mana. It ramps, it gains life, everything that a Simic ramp deck wants to do. So I'm happy giving familiar a B as well. Just another very solid card. Then Moss Pit Skeleton, 2 mana for a 2-2 Plant Skeleton at Uncommon. And it has Kicker for 3 generic mana. And if Mospit's skeleton was kicked, it enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it. So we essentially get a five mana five five. And whenever one or more plus one counters are put on a creature you control, if skeleton is in your graveyard, you may put Mospit's skeleton on top of your library instead. So a nice recursive threat. And the fact that you can get it back in a late game and then have access to five mana five five over and over seems quite strong, because typically you're pretty happy drawing a 5-mana five 5-5 five five in the late game if you're top decking. So yeah, Skeleton seems great, another B. All these uncommon multicolor cards are going to get a pretty high grade, but they're often also an incentive for you to move into those colors, so that's not too surprising. Then we've got Murasa Root Grazer. A green and a white for a 2-3 beast and uncommon. It has vigilance and it has two different tap abilities, so we can potentially attack and then still use the ability of uh, tapping the root grazer once it's already declared as an attacker. And the first one says you may put a basic land card from your hand onto the battlefield, so it can potentially enable landfall, can potentially enable landfall an additional time. And it of course also can help you ramp if you're just holding a bunch of lands and you want to cast some expensive spells. And then the second ability says return target basic land you control to its owner's hand. So important to note here it says basic land. So you're not allowed to pick up those uh, lands that can also be spells on the other half. So it is pretty much limited to picking up lands to re-enable landfall. But that's still a pretty valuable ability, because there's a ton of landfall synergies in the set. And 2 mana for a 2-3 Vigilance is already above average. So I think Root Grazer is quite good, especially in some sort of Naya landfall deck, where you've got a lot of creatures that have landfall abilities. So, yeah, once again I'm giving the Root Grazer a B, just a, a solid card within that color pair. Then we have Nahiri, Heir of the Ancients, or first mythic rare here. Four mana for a four loyalty planeswalker, and the plus one makes a one one white core warrior creature token, and we can attach an equipment we control to it. Then the minus two says, look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a warrior or equipment card from among them and put it into your hand, and the rest goes on the bottom of your library in a random order. And then the minus three deals damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to twice the number of equipment you control. So a lot of useful abilities, they mostly synergize with equipment. So if you don't have any equipment in your deck whatsoever, then you're mostly going to be looking at plus one to make 
a 1-1 one, one token. So it does seem pretty solid still, even without too many equipment in the deck, just a Planeswalker that sits in play and keeps on making tokens. But of course, hopefully you've got a few equipment in the deck to synergize with her. And then, uh, yeah, Nahira seems pretty strong. It's not an S rating like we might see with some other Planeswalkers. Thinking back uh, to Theros, for example, we had Ashiok, which I would definitely give an S rating. But uh, Nahir is still pretty good, so definitely worthy of an A. Then we have Nissa of Shadowed Bows. Four mana for a four loyalty Nissa Planeswalker that has a landfall. Don't often see that on Planeswalker, on Planeswalker cards. And she says, whenever land enters a battlefield under your control, put a loyalty counter on Nissa. So we can potentially play Nissa later in the game and go all the way up to 5 loyalty before using the minus 5 ability. And then the plus one says, untap target land you control. You may have it become a 3-3 elemental creature with haste and menace until end of turn. And it's still a land. And then the minus 5 lets you put a creature card with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of lands you control onto the battlefield from your hand or graveyard with two additional plus one plus one counters on it. So, yeah, that's a lot of powerful effects. The fact that you can potentially minus five the same turn you play Nissa and reanimate a creature is pretty strong. Has the flexibility of both putting it from your hand onto the battlefield or the graveyard. Of course, the graveyard is a bit better value. And then those two additional plus one counters are definitely very relevant as well, as your creature will be even bigger. So yeah, Nissa seems quite strong. Just a way to continuously apply pressure with menacing lands and eventually sink all your loyalty into a giant creature, whether it's from the graveyard or your hand. So yeah, I'll give Nissa an A as well. Don't think I'm quite giving it all the way to an S, but it's it's definitely getting close, might be an A+. I think it's better than Nahiri since it requires a bit less build around, you don't need those equipment. But uh, I think I'll, I'll save the S rating for the cards that are truly unbeatable. But uh, yeah, Nissa's definitely very good. Although the big difference here from uh, previous Nissa's is that the land is only until end of turn. So it's not going to stay a 3-3 creature land forever. So that does mean that Nissa can definitely be pressured a bit more easily. Then we have Omnath, Locus of Creation, 4 mana. One of each color except for black, and we get a 4-4 legendary elemental, and when Omnath enters a battlefield you get to draw a card. So of course the main challenge with playing Omnath is getting those four different colors, but uh, we'll see that there's a decent bit of mana fixing, especially in green, as there usually is. So I don't think it's going to be impossible to cast Omnath even in limited. And then Omnath also has Landfall, saying whenever land enters a battlefield under your control, you gain 4 life if this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn. If it's the second time, you get to add 4 mana to your mana pool. And if it's the third time, you get to deal 4 damage to each opponent and each planeswalker you don't control. So in limited, getting multiple landfalls each turn is going to be pretty challenging. I don't expect that to be the case very often. But um, let's say we can get two landfall triggers per turn, if we kind of build around it, then we're generating additional mana, we're getting a bit of life. So this definitely sets up a nice dirtly multicolor deck where you're just uh, splashing all the best cards in each color and probably using green for mana fixing. And then Omnath gains you life just to stay alive long enough to pull off all your shenanigans. So this seems like a very fun card to try and build around in Limited. Um, do I recommend pack one, pick one, taking this and building around it? Yeah, it's probably going to be a little tricky. I don't recommend it for uh, people that are playing the, f the set for the first time necessarily. But uh, I think it's going to be possible. And uh, in that deck, Omnath is going to be pretty good. If you're drafting a streamlined two-color deck, and you open Omnath later in the draft, then I don't necessarily recommend train wrecking your draft just to include Omnath. But uh, yeah, definitely a fun build around. And in the multicolor green decks, I think it's going to be quite strong as well. So 
What to give Omnath overall? Probably a B, B+. Plus. It's a powerful card if you can cast it, but of course that's a pretty big if. Then we've got Aura, Skyclave Harophant, 4 mana for a 3-3, Legendary Core Cleric with Lifelink, and whenever Aura or another Cleric you control dies, you get to return target Cleric card with a lesser converted mana cost from your graveyard to the battlefield. So a nice bit of recursion, 4 mana for a 3-3 Lifelink, not amazing, but playable. And of course, it's a Cleric for those additional Cleric synergies that we've already seen. And uh, yeah, as long as you've got a few additional Clerics in your deck, this should be pretty strong. Don't know if I'm quite giving this an A, I think it's still rather in the B range. But uh, yeah, if you can draft a ton of Clerics and kind of go down the chain of one Cleric dying, returning a different Cleric, and so on and so forth, then it's going to be quite strong. So I'll give Aura a B+, definitely one of the better Bs we've given so far, but does require quite a bit of setup for it to shine. Then we've got Philath, World Sculptor, 6 mana for a 5-5 Legendary Elemental at rare, and when Philath enters the battlefield you get to make a 0-1 green plant creature token for each basic land you control. So kind of reminiscent of Avenger of Zendikar. And then Landfall says whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, you can put four plus one plus one counters on target plant you control. So only one plant token gets those counters. But still, getting four counters for every single land is uh, quite strong. Six mana for a five five that makes a whole bunch of plants when it enters the battlefield. Seems amazing. So I think Philath might be pushing up towards the S rating here. It's a card that can come down, put, let's say you can play Philath and play land afterwards, then you're adding at least 9 power to the board, and then a whole bunch of additional toughness. And then uh, if Philath goes unanswered for at least one more turn, you can add another 4 counters to the board at least. So yeah, Philath I think is worthy of an S rating, can definitely dominate a game all by himself, can catch you back up if you're behind and then can close out the game very quickly too. So I'll give Philath an S. Next up we have a Ravager's Mace, our first equipment, 3 mana including a black and a red for an artifact equipment, and when it enters the battlefield you can attach it to target creature you control. So a lot of these equipments we'll see get attached to a creature right away, so you don't need to worry about paying the initial equip cost. And then the equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 0 for each creature in your party and it has menace. And so this is the first time we're getting the whole party explanation. Your party consists of up to one of each of cleric, rogue, warrior and wizard. So those four creature types make up a party. If a creature has multiple of those creature types it still only counts towards one of those members. So you can only have a full party if you actually have four different creatures in play and uh, they all have at least one of those types without too much overlap. So it's going to be difficult to have a full party, but as we'll see looking at the creature types, it's not going to be too difficult to have a couple of the creatures that uh, have those creature types. So on average we can expect this to give at least plus 2 plus 0, and then a menace to boot. So pretty solid equipment. And then the equip cost afterwards is going to be 2, a black and a red, so pretty expensive to re-equip, so you kind of want the creature to keep the equipment for quite a while. But uh, yeah, it does have an immediate impact, giving menace and additional power, making it difficult to block, and then if the opponent does try and double block, they're probably going to end up losing multiple creatures. So I think Ravager's Maze is pretty solid, a bit expensive on the re-equip, but uh, overall I would still give it a C+, I think. If you're playing a red-black deck, you're almost never going to cut this from your deck, so that's kind of the definition of a C+. Then we've got Surring Thought Thief, a black and a blue for a 1-3 human rogue at uncommon. It has flash, it has flying, and as long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, rogues you control get plus 1 plus 0, including the thief itself. And whenever one or more rogues you control 
attack. Each opponent mills two cards. So you can only mill for two at a time, even if you have multiple rogues attacking. So using the thief as your only mill effect is going to be pretty slow at getting eight or more cards in a graveyard. But this uh, thief does still have a ton of extra text. A 1-3 flash flyer for two mana is already pretty decent. And then blue-black does heavily support this mill mechanic which uh, also works well with all these rogue synergies. So getting 8 cards in the opponent's graveyard when playing a blue-black rogue deck is not going to be too difficult. And then you get this very powerful anthem effect as well, all for just 2 mana. So yeah, the thief seems quite excellent and uh, definitely one of the better payoffs for going into this rogue deck. So what do we give the thief? You do need, do need to build around it, so in a random blue-black control deck this is going to be pretty average, but in a very synergistic rogue deck this is going to be at its best. I think I'm giving this a B plus, maybe leaning up towards an A minus even in the very synergistic versions, but uh, we'll go with a B plus for now, definitely one of the better uncommons we've seen so far. Next up we have Spoils of Adventure, 6 mana for an instant at uncommon, costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party, and then you get to gain 3 life and draw 3 cards. And blue, white and green, kind of the band colors, those are kind of the color pairs that have most of the party synergies, so having this in blue, white makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah. It's not going to be too difficult to cast this for like 4 mana, let's say, and then 4 mana, draw 3, and gain 3 at instant speed is quite a bargain. So Spoils of Adventure seems great, definitely at least a B, and in the very synergistic party decks it might be even higher than that. Then we've got Umara Mystic, 1 a blue and a red for a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon, it has flying, and whenever you cast an instant, sorcery, or wizard spell, the mystic gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. So it's kind of like super prowess, it doesn't trigger off non-creature spells outside of instants and sorceries, but it also triggers off wizards, and there's quite a few wizard synergies in the set, as you can imagine. And the mystic flies, so kind of reminiscent of the wee dragonauts from the uh, original Ravnica. And it's not too difficult to potentially trigger this multiple times per turn. If you've got a few cheap instants and sorceries or wizards. So the Mystic definitely delivers the beatdown. So I'm happy giving Mystic a B, B plus as well. Definitely a very strong card if you can build around it. Then we've got Verazol, the Split Current. Axe a blue and a green for a Legendary Serpent at rare. And when Verazol enters a battlefield, it enters with a plus one plus one counter for each mana spent to cast it. So if Axe equals zero, it still enters with two counters. And then, of course, the more mana you can sink into it, the better. And whenever you cast a kicked spell, you may remove two plus one plus one counters from Verazol. And if you do, copy that spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. So, very interesting card. It's always going to be pretty great if you're in blue-green, since it just kind of fills out the curve, and uh, you can sink as much as much mana as you want into it, so it makes for a great curve topper. And then in a kicker synergy deck, having the flexibility of potentially copying your kicker spells seems quite strong as well. So, yeah, in the kicker synergy deck this is going to be quite strong. Do we go all the way up to an A? Yeah, I guess an A isn't too far-fetched. Maybe not the most convincing A ever, but definitely up there. So I'll give this an A. Then we have... They're not making it easy with the pronunciation here. Yasharn, Implacable Earth. 4 mana for a 4-4 legendary elemental boar at rare. And when Yasharn enters a battlefield, you get to search your library for a basic forest card and a basic plains card, reveal them and put them into your hand, and then players can pay life or sacrifice non-land permanents to cast spells or activate abilities. There's not a ton of cards 
in Limited, I imagine that uh, involve paying life or sacrificing non-land permanents, but definitely something that might have some constructed applications. Typically is gonna be good against any black decks that typically involve paying life and sacrificing stuff. Getting to put a forest and planes in your hands is quite valuable if you have any landfall synergies, thins out the deck a bit, and you get a 4-mana 4-4 on top. So definitely a nice value engine, regardless of the last line of text. So yeah, your Sharn seems great, definitely worthy of an A rating. Then we have Zagros, Thief of Heartbeats. 6 mana for a 4-4 legendary vampire rogue at rare. And then it costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party, so can potentially cost just a single black and red. And then we get a 4-4 with flying, death touch and haste, saying other creatures you control have death touch. That's uh, already just a super powerful ability, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a planeswalker, destroy that Planeswalker, so your creatures not only have Death Touch, but they also have Death Touch for Planeswalkers. Zagros likes to party, I guess. Uh, if we're playing Zagros for 6 mana, it's a bit on the pricey side, even though it's still quite powerful, as it has both Flying and Haste, so has an immediate impact when it enters battlefield. But if we can cast Zagros for, let's say, 4 or even 5 mana, it's uh, quite a bargain giving all your other creatures death touch means that if you have any sort of board presence, your opponent simply can't make any profitable attacks anymore until they deal with Zagras, and in the meantime you're hitting them in the air for 4 over and over. So yeah, Zagras seems pretty strong. Now, the one thing with Zagras that's different from some of the previous rares we've seen is that if the opponent does have a removal spell at the ready, they can potentially deal with Zagras without too much downside, and uh, outside of maybe getting an extra attack in the turn you play Zagros, thanks to the Death Touch, you're not going to have any lasting impact. So I'm reluctant to give Zagros an S rating because of that, even though it is a very impactful card, just because most removal spells will be able to deal with it cleanly. Of course, if the removal spell is some sort of aura that doesn't fully take Zagros out of commission, and you get to keep that Death Touch ability, then it's still pretty strong, but any removal that can get Zagras off the board is going to be a decent answer to it. So definitely still an A rating, but I don't think I'm quite going all the way to an S. And next up we have Zareth Sun, the Trickster, 5 mana for a 4-4 legendary Merfolk Rogue at rare, and it also has Flash. And for 2 blue and a black we can return an unblocked attacking rogue we control to its owner's hand, and put Zareth from our hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking, so reminiscent of the ninjutsu mechanic, but instead of ninjas we're dealing with rogues, and whenever Zareth san deals combat damage to a player, you may put target permanent card from that player's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. So that's a lot of uh, text, but uh, yeah, this card seems quite amazing, if the opponent has anything in their graveyard whatsoever, which is probably going to be the case, considering blue-black has a ton of mill effects, you're going to get a ton of value right away, and it's not going to be too difficult to get the first hidden thanks to that 4-mana ninjutsu-type ability. So Zareth seems very good, and does require a bit of build around. If you don't have any other rogues in the deck, it's going to be a little tricky, to get that first hidden, but uh, yeah, definitely giving Zareth an A. Our first equipment, Cliffhaven Kite Sail, one mana for an artifact equipment, and when the Kite Sail enters a battlefield we can attach it to target creature we control, and the equipped creature has flying, and then the equip cost is two mana afterwards. So, a nice little artifact. It's going to be at its best in a deck that want to be very aggressive and get some damage in early and then use a kite sail to kind of secure those last points of damage. Maybe a green deck that has very large creatures that tend to get shun blocked. Usually don't want more than one kite sail in your decks because it does have some pretty significant diminishing returns. 
but uh, yeah, I can easily imagine Kite Sail being a nice one-off to have in most aggressive decks. If your deck has a lot of uh, kind of non-creature spell synergies and you're not relying too much on creatures, then uh, the Kite Sail, of course, is not going to be a card you're too interested in. We saw the flying equipment and Theros, I remember, being pretty solid there as well. So Kite Sail, probably giving this a C. Just a playable card, and some decks might want it, some decks might not, but uh, definitely a card that's going to make the deck some amount of the time. So that seems perfect for a C rating. Next up we have Forsaken Monuments, 5 mana for a Mythic Rare. Legendary Artifact saying colorless creatures you control get plus 2 plus 2. And whenever you tap a permanent for colorless mana, you can add an additional colorless mana. And whenever you cast a colorless spell, you also gain two life. Now, scanning ahead, there's not that many colorless creatures in the set. So this seems more like a plant for constructed, where you might be able to build some decks around it. But for limited, I don't think this is going to have a ton of uses. Maybe if you somehow get your hands on a couple of the colorless creatures in the set, you can uh, consider it. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, this is more a card for constructed. So, not sure if I'm giving this all the way to an F rating, since I could see some weird cases where you might uh, consider this. But uh, we'll give it a conservative D rating instead of a full F. Next up we have a Lithoform Engine, another Mythic Rare, Legendary Artifact, this one costs 4 mana, and it has a ton of useful abilities. For 2 mana, we can tap it and copy target activated ability or triggered ability we control, and choose new targets for the copy. For 3 mana, we can tap it to copy target instant or sorcery spell we control, and choose new targets for the copy. And for 4 mana, we can copy target permanent spell we control. And the copy becomes a token. So, let's say we're just playing an average limited deck that has, let's say, 14, 15 creatures, not that many instants and sorceries or activated or triggered abilities. Then we're still looking at 4 mana for something that then gets to keep on making tokens for 4 mana. So it doesn't actually copy a creature that's in play. We need to cast a creature and then activate this. Otherwise it wouldn't say spell, it would say permanent. So you're having to pay four additional mana on top of casting a creature does make it pretty clunky. And then I guess if you've got some cheap instants and sorceries, this could do some work. Yeah, this is definitely a weird one. At first glance, it seems quite strong. Uh, upon reading, it doesn't seem all that amazing. You do need a lot of ramp for this to to work in the first place. Uh, but in the late game, if you do get to the late game and you can cast some 2-3 mana creatures and then copy them for 4 mana, it does start adding up. So, yeah, this is definitely one of the more difficult cards to rate since it also varies depending on how fast the format ends up being. If the format ends up being pretty slow, then this card could definitely get a lot of value over time. If the format ends up being pretty fast, where people can kill you on turn 4, turn 5, then um, it's probably not going to be a card you're very interested in. So, what do we give Engine? I'll give it a conservative C plus for now. I think I'm probably going to start it, and then we can kind of see if it performs or not. But uh, I imagine that you're probably going to include it in most decks where you draft it. But uh, in the hyper-aggressive decks, you maybe don't have room for it. And if you're facing aggressive decks in best of three, you can easily sideboard it out. But if the game does drag out, then it's definitely going to help you take over the late game. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a C plus. A bit of a difficult one to evaluate for sure. Next up we have Myriad Construct. 4 mana for a 4-4 artifact creature construct. And it has Kicker for 3 mana. 
and if Construct was kicked, it enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it for each non non basic land your opponents control. And when the construct becomes the target of a spell, sacrifice it and create a number of one one colorless construct artifact creature tokens equal to its power. Of course, this set contains a lot of those uh, spells that have a land on the backside, so we can assume that most opponents are going to end up with one or two non-basic lands over the course of a game. The kicker ability is definitely relevant in limited, even though it's probably going to be even more relevant for constructed. And then we're still getting a 4-mana 4-4, four four, which is, you know, a decent card for sure. And if the opponent tries to get rid of it, it's going to split up into four 1-1 one one tokens, at the very least. So, yeah, definitely seems like a good card. Very flexible, goes into any deck, so makes for a perfect first pick. So, happy giving the Construct an A. Then we have a Relic Amulet, 2 mana for an uncommon artifact, saying whenever you cast an instant, a sorcery or wizard spell, put a charge counter on it, and for 2 mana we can tap it and remove all charge counters from it, and deal that much damage to target creature. So, takes a while to get going, but in a deck that is centered around these instant sorceries and wizards, presumably it's going to be a blue-red deck. I could see this getting quite a bit of value. Let's say you play this on turn 2, turn 3 you play wizard, turn 4 you play a removal spell, it has two counters on it, turn 5 you maybe play a third, and you get to activate this right away, dealing 3 damage. Of course that's kind of the best case scenario. If you draw this later in the game, it could easily do nothing at all. So, in the blue-red spells deck, where you've got a bunch of wizards, this is certainly playable, but it does require a bit of work and setup, so I don't think this gets a very high rating just because it's pretty niche, but uh, I'll, I'll give this a C. Like, some decks are going to want it and be pretty happy with it, other decks don't want it at all, so you can expect to get this pretty late in draft, I imagine. Then we have a Relic Axe, 2 mana for an uncommon equipment, saying when the Relic Axe enters the battlefield you can attach it to target creature control, and the equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 1, and if it's a warrior, gets plus 2 plus 1 instead, and then the equip cost is only 2 mana, so it's relatively inexpensive to both play and then equip afterwards, and of course we do get that initial free equip. So outside of a warrior deck this is not super appealing, 2 mana and then 2 mana to equip for plus 1 plus 1 is pretty pricey. But uh, in a warrior deck, let's say you've got at least 6 or 7 warriors in your deck, then this is definitely going to be pretty strong, plus 2 plus 1 for just 2 mana is uh, quite a bargain, and then just 2 mana to move it around. Yeah, I think this card is probably going to be going at a similar rate as the previous uncommon we've covered that wants to go in the blue red spells deck where you've got a bunch of wizards but uh, i do think relic axe in the warrior deck is going to be even better than the uh, previous artifact in the wizard deck so where we gave the previous one a c i think i'm okay giving this a c plus as it will be pretty high value in any sort of warrior deck Next up we have a Relic Golem, 3 mana for an uncommon artifact creature Golem, and it's a 6-6, six, six. so I imagine there's quite a drawback. A Relic Golem can't attack or block unless an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, and for 2 mana we can tap it to mill target player for 2 cards. So we can also mill ourselves if that's something we're interested in somehow, but of course the first priority is going to be to mill the opponent to get this attacking and blocking. So it's a pretty niche card. You're probably gonna want this in the blue-black rogues deck, where you've got a bunch of cards that rely on having a full graveyard for the opponents. So it's definitely a synergy card. I don't think any random deck is gonna want this, but in the rogue mill deck this is gonna be pretty strong, as you not only get access to a card that can potentially win the game by milling the opponents, which in limited is easier than in constructed, 
but it's also a 6-6 six -six that can block, and then in the opponent's end step you can still activate this. So I imagine this will often just win the game by milling instead of by attacking and blocking. Yeah, in the blue-black decks this is probably going to be a B. Outside of those decks I don't think you're going to want it too often. But I could be wrong, and this might end up being a card you include in a lot of other decks as well. But I'll start out with a conservative C plus rating for Relic Golem. But just be aware that not every deck is going to be interested in it. Then we have a Relic Vial, 3 mana for another uncommon artifact. And for 2 mana we can tap the Vial and sacrifice a creature to draw a card. And then as long as you control a Cleric, the Vial also has the ability that whenever a creature you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So you don't have to sacrifice a Cleric, just need to have one in play. And then this starts draining the opponent whenever a creature you control dies, and it doesn't even have to die to the Vial's sacrifice effect. It's just kind of like having a permanent Blood Artist on the battlefield, kind of. So, yeah, this card seems pretty strong, especially if you've got some Sacrifice Synergies, and we've seen some of those in the Black-White Cleric deck. So another uncommon artifact that kind of goes with some Tribal Synergies, similar to the one with the Warrior and the one with the Wizards. So this completes the cycle nicely. And uh, I think this card's even playable outside of a Cleric deck if you just have a bunch of Sacrifice Fodder that you don't mind getting rid of. Similar to the Cauldron from M21 in the uh, recent set. So what do we give Relic Vial overall? I'll probably give this C plus as well, just a, a solid artifact in the right deck for it. But not every deck is going to be equally interested in it, so... Yeah, we'll give this a C+. Plus. And then we have Seagate Colossus, 7 mana for a common artifact creature, Golem Warrior. And it's a 7-5, but it costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party. So this can fit into any color combination. And presumably you've got a decent amount of clerics, rogues, warriors and wizards. So those are the four tribes that were represented by the last four uncommon artifacts we've covered. And once again here with a common artifact creature as well. So again, getting two creatures in your party is probably going to be pretty trivial. Getting three or four is going to be a lot more challenging. But uh, let's imagine we have two creatures in our party, then this is still a 5 mana 7-5. So not too bad. So it does seem like a decent curve topper if your deck needs a curve topper and uh, you've got a decent number of creatures with those corresponding creature types. But it's probably not going to be a very high pick. So probably just to see a card that you're sometimes going to play, sometimes you're not going to play it. Just a fine filler card. And then uh, we've got a rare artifact with Skyclave Relic. 3 mana for an artifact that is indestructible and it also has kicker for three generic mana and when the relic enters the battlefield if it was kicked you get to create two tapped tokens that are copies of skyclave relic so we get three indestructible artifacts and what do these artifacts do for us they tap to add one mana of any color so this is probably going to be pretty fun in the multicolor shenanigans deck where you can maybe play Omnath as well. Outside of those decks you're probably not gonna really want this card. But uh, yeah, definitely a fun card with an interesting mechanic. So overall what do we give Skyclave Relic? Uh, I'll give it a C. Like in the blue-green kicker deck you're probably pretty interested in this card as well just because it ramps and has kicker, so it can potentially work with other cards that care about kicker. So maybe in the blue-green deck, even if it doesn't splash any crazy colors, it could still be okay. But uh, generally speaking, I don't imagine you're going to want a random 3-mana ramp artifact, unless you're uh, trying to work up towards a ton of mana for some expensive kicker synergies. So yeah, I'll give Skyclave Relic a C. Not every deck is going to want it. 
but in sealed this probably gets quite a bit better since sealed tends to be a bit slower and you want to try and play as many of the powerful cards as your pool has access to so this definitely goes up in value in sealed as opposed to draft skyclave sentinel three mana for a common artifact creature gargoyle it's a 2-3 and it has kicker for four mana and it's otherwise a flying defender so can only block but if the sentinel was kicked it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it so a four five flyer with defender and as long as it has a plus one plus one counter on it it can attack as though it didn't have defender so it's a three mana two three flyer on defense and potentially a seven mana four five that can uh, also fly on offense so it's not the most efficient rate but it is probably an okay curve filler if you just need a an early blocker you can throw this out there and if you can save the mana to kick it later it's not a bad win condition but uh again this is probably a card that's a ramp deck is going to be more interested in especially a blue green kicker deck so outside of those decks it's probably a pretty bad filler card so not sure if i'm going all the way to a d or if it's closer to a c but it's somewhere in that range a pretty niche card that's not often going to make the cut but if it does make the cut it could actually be surprisingly good if you've got some ramp to support it so i'll go with a c for sentinel here next up we've got spare supplies two mana common artifact enters the battlefield tapped and when it enters the battlefield you get to draw a card so it replaces itself right away and for two mana you can tap it and sacrifice it to then draw an extra card so it's pretty slow card advantage but it will eventually draw you an extra card maybe it has some additional synergies as well although i don't think we're gonna see a ton of cards that care about sacrificing artifacts so yeah eventually it's a four mana draw two that's i guess on the level of uh, inspiration which you sometimes end up playing although you can't sacrifice it right away since it enters battlefield tapped so in, in the late game you'll have to wait an extra turn to get the second card out of it so yeah it's definitely a playable card probably just a c some decks that don't have a ton of two drops will be pretty happy with this as a curve filler especially the more controlling decks decks that want to curve out with creatures probably don't want this too much but uh yeah fine card next up we've got stonework pack beast two mana for a two one beast at common and stonework pack beast is also a cleric rogue warrior and wizard so it fills the party nicely and for two mana we can add one mana of any color to our mana pool so prismite got a small upgrade here as it can now fill out your party so if it didn't have that initial line of text of having all those creature types this card would be a d with that additional line of text it all of a sudden turns on a ton of your party synergies and it can go into any deck i mean i'm still not super high on the pack beast two mana two one is still not amazing but uh yeah the fact that it can fill out a party definitely makes this pretty playable yeah i'll probably just give this a c playable card and uh if you've got a ton of party payoffs then you're probably gonna want to look into the pack beast but otherwise it's still probably not gonna make the deck then we've got utility knife one mana artifact equipment when it enters the battlefield you can attach it right away and it gives the equipped creature plus one plus one and then you can move it for three mana so pretty cheap to play initially not the most high impact equipment out there and then three mana to move it is pretty expensive means that you can't easily move this around so you can attack with a creature that has the knife equipped and then move it back to a creature on defense that's usually where equipment are at their best if you can move it around cheaply so if it was three mana to play and then one mana to equip it would probably be better than the way it's currently worded so yeah i'm not too high on the utility knife compare this to the previous equipment we've seen that gets plus one plus one and plus two plus one to a warrior 
this is probably less desirable. Of course, you don't need to necessarily have a warrior deck for this to function. But uh, yeah, it's still kind of inefficient. So I'll give Utility Knife a C. Might even go as far as a D. It's a playable card if you need some way to enhance your creatures, if you're a creature-heavy deck. But it's definitely not the first card I would look at. And then we get to the lands. And there's quite a few lands in the set, although these are just the normal lands that don't have a spell on the other half. So we've got base camp, an uncommon land that enters the battlefield tapped, and then taps for one colorless. And then you can also tap it to add one man of any color to spend on clerics, rogues, warrior, or wizard spells, or to activate the abilities of those creatures as well. So the fact that it enters battlefield tapped, of course, makes this a lot less exciting than it would be otherwise. It does still sort of fix your mana, but it's pretty limited in what spells you can uh, cast with it. So I'm not too high on base camp. Probably give this a D. So this is our first dual land. Boulder Loft Pathway. We're actually looking at uh, the wrong half here. So this is the front half, as you can tell by the little shiny symbol at the bottom. So Pathway is a forest at the front half, and then a plains essentially at the back. So when you play the Pathway, you have to choose which side you play first. So depending on your needs, it's either a plains or a forest. It's not a basic land, so it doesn't have the basic land type. So that's of course pretty important as well. And um, yeah, I guess you can also tell by looking at the uh, triangles. So the black triangle is a front and then the double triangle is uh, the back. So that's another way to tell. So yeah, all the pathways are pretty decent mana fixing. And uh, the fact that they're untapped makes them pretty appealing. So what do we give all the pathways? I'll probably give them a B. It's just solid mana fixing. And uh, yeah, definitely a neat design that I'm happy to see constructed as well. So we've got the branch loft pathway. Next up we've got the bright climb pathway. This is white and black. Then we've got clear water pathway. This is blue and black. And then Crack Crown Pathway is the red-green one. And then we've got a Crawling Barrens as well. I guess we'll give this one a, a new rating. A Colorless Lands, and for 4 mana we can put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And then it becomes a 0-0 zero, zero elemental creature until end of turn, that's still a land. So this does get bigger every time you activate this. So the first time it's only going to be a 2-2, but the second time it's already a 4-4. And it's just going to keep on growing. And you don't even have to attack or block with it, you can just sink 4 mana into it and keep putting counters on the barons. So as far as creature lands go, this is a pretty good one. And I also expect this to see a bit of constructed play. And yeah, good point, you don't even have to turn it into a creature. You can just pay 4 mana, put 2 counters on it and not even risk exposing it to a removal spell, since it's a May ability to turn it into a creature. So Baron seems pretty strong, and is definitely going to be a nice addition to any limited mana base, even if it is a colorless land. So I'll give Barons a B, just a, a solid inclusion in most decks. Then we've got another dual land here with the Needle Verge pathway, red and white. And then finally, Lava Glide Pathway. This is the blue-red one. So not every two-color pair gets a dual land here, but I'm sure we'll see the cycle completed at some point. Throne of Makindi, a rare land that taps for colorless, and for one mana we can tap it and put a charge counter on it, and we can tap and remove a charge counter from it 
to add two mana of any one color that we can only spend on kicked spells. So this wants to go in the kicker decks. So how good is this in a kicker deck? We can essentially charge up our mana because we're not really generating additional mana since we had to spend one, one, one more mana to put the charge counter on it in the first place. But it's a nice way to potentially save up a bit of mana to set up a, a big explosive turn where you cast a big kicked spell. And then it also fixes your mana for those kicker spells, so maybe makes it possible for you to splash some off-color kicker cards as well. Yeah, this doesn't seem amazing, pretty niche. So in the kicker decks, maybe you can uh, make room for this, but I don't expect to see this in a ton of uh, limited mana bases, so I'll give this one a D. And all right, we've covered all the multicolor spells, all the artifacts, and now also all the lands. So now it's time to take a look at our first color, which is going to be white. All right, first white card, Allied Assault. Two and a white for an instant at uncommon, saying up to two target creatures each get plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures in your party. So once again, taking kind of the average number of two creatures in your party, this is pretty strong. And then of course, if you ever get to three or four creatures in your party, this can be a total blowout. So yeah, Allied Assault, definitely a very strong trick. And I'm pretty happy giving this a C plus. Next up, we've got Angel of Destiny, five mana for a two six mythic rare. Angel Cleric with flying and double strike. And whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you and that player each gain that much life. And then at the beginning of your end step, if you have at least 15 life more than your starting life total, aka 35 life, each player Angel of Destiny attacked this turn loses the game. So an alternate win condition card. So it's definitely an interesting one to evaluate. So 5 mana, 2 6, flying double strike. That's uh, very difficult to attack into or to block. And whenever creature you control deals combat damage to a player, we both gain life. Of course, if we can get to 35, it doesn't matter if the opponent's at 50 or 100 life, because they're just going to lose the game. And the Angel of Destiny doesn't even have to hit the opponent for you to win the game with the last part. You just need to attack. Let's imagine you're playing a very aggressive curve out deck. You get the opponent to, let's say, four life. Then Angel of Destiny is not the way to necessarily close out the game. Definitely going to make for some interesting racing situations where sometimes you're not going to want to attack until you can make sure that you can win the game with the alternate win condition since you don't want to get the opponent a bunch of free life. But, you know, you're also gaining life at the same time. So once the Angel of Destiny hits the table, the entire game kind of revolves around Angel of Destiny. I'm hesitant to give this one an S, since there are definitely situations where the ability might backfire. But uh, it doesn't seem incredibly difficult to win with the alternate win condition here. So I'll give this an A. Definitely a fun card that's going to make for some interesting games. But uh, maybe not the best mythic in the set. Next up we've got Angel Hearts Protector, 2 and a white for a 3-2 Human Cleric at common. And when the Protector enters the battlefield, target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. So just a nice 3-drop, goes well into any aggressive deck, but even later in the game can still maybe set up a nice attack. And 3-mana 3-2 three three is not a terrible rate, so yeah, decent cards. Probably somewhere between a C and a C+. Start out with a C plus for Angel Heart Protector. Then we've got Archon of Emiria, two and a white for a two three Archon at a rare with flying, and each player can cast more than one spell each turn. And non basic lands your opponent's control enter battlefield tapped as well. Now for limited, that last line of text is probably not super impactful because most of the non basic lands enter battlefield tapped already. 
but not being able to cast more than one spell is definitely relevant in both limited and constructed. And then a 2-3 flying for 3 is not a bad deal. Now of course it is symmetrical, so we also won't be able to play more than one spell each turn. So yeah, where do we rate Arkan? Probably just a C+. Plus. Definitely a solid card, but it's it is a double-edged sword, so it's not always going to be strictly upside. Next up we have Archpriest of Iona, single white, for a human cleric at rare. And the priest's power is equal to the number of creatures in your party. Of course, being a cleric itself, it's going to have at least one power. And it then has a two toughness at all times. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, meaning cleric, rogue, warrior, and wizard, target creature gets plus one plus one and gains flying until end of turn. So you can also target the priest itself if you want. Again, getting a full party is going to be difficult, but this costing one mana is definitely helpful, as it's going to make it easier to have a full party as soon as possible. So by default, it's a one mana one two, not too difficult to get it up to a 2-2 two, two, or a 3-2. So for one mana, this seems pretty nice and a, a great way to get to a full party as quickly as possible. So priests, I think I'm willing to give a B just because of how efficient it is. And if there's ever a constructed deck centered around the party mechanic, this is definitely going to be part of it. Then we've got Attended Healer. 3 and white for a 2-3 core cleric at uncommon and whenever you gain life for the first time each turn you get to make a 1-1 a white cat creature token and for 2 and a white another target cleric gains lifelink until end of turn. So can give the healer itself lifelink but there's definitely no shortage of clerics in white. And yeah being able to make a couple cat tokens does add up. So it's definitely a synergy card that requires a bit of build around. But in the right deck, I could definitely see this being a nice value engine that keeps on making 1-1 cat tokens. So Attended Healer, I'll give this one a C+. Nice mana sync as well. Then we've got Canyon Jerboa, 2 and a white for a 1-2 mouse at Uncommon. And Landfall gives creatures you control plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So nice anthem effect, a 1-2 with landfall that pumps a team for one. Definitely a solid card for the aggressive landfall decks. And of course art is uh, quite adorable as well. So what do we give Jerboa? Especially if you can somehow enable landfall twice in the same turn, this is going to add up quickly. But uh, yeah, Jerboa seems decent, at the very least a C+. Next up, we've got Cliffhaven Cellsword, one and white for a 3-1 core warrior, and that's it. So a warrior for party purposes, and we've seen some other warrior synergies already. So two mana, three, one. If there's a lot of ways to punish one toughness creatures, this is probably not going to be one of the better two drops. But if you can equip this, maybe give this evasion somehow, give it flying, menace or first strike, then uh, a 3-1 is not a bad stat line. So, Soul Sword, probably just a C, but uh, if there's a ton of ways to punish one toughness creatures, it might even go down to a D. Next up, we've got Dauntless, Unity, one and a white for an instant, and it also has Kicker for one and a white, and creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn, and if it's kicked, they get plus two plus one until end of turn instead. So for two mana, it's a pretty weak pump spell, but you do get that flexibility. And then for four mana, it's essentially Inspired Charge, which can be quite strong in a token deck that can go wide or just present lots of cheap creatures. It's a, a combo trick if you need a combo trick, and the more your deck can go wide, the better the kicker ability is going to be. So, yeah, playable trick. I'll give this a C. Next up, 
We've got Disenchant, reprinted, one on a white for an instant to destroy an artifact or enchantment. Don't think this is going to be a format where you're going to main deck Disenchant, but always a serviceable sideboard card. So we'll give this a D. Emiria Captain, three and a white for an uncommon Angel Warrior with Flying and Vigilance. Starts out as a 1 1, but when the Captain enters a battlefield, you can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it for each creature in your party. And of course, the Captain being a warrior itself means that it's at least getting one plus 1 plus 1 counter. And it doesn't take much for this to become a 3 3 or a 4 4 Flying Vigilance, which is a pretty good deal for 4 mana. So, Captain. I think I'm even giving a B here. Just seems like one of the better payoffs for the party mechanics so far. And then we've got our first Mythic Rare that can uh, also be played as a land potentially. Emirios Call, 4 and triple white for a sorcery that makes two 4-4 four, four white Angel Warrior creature tokens with flying. Non-angel creatures you control gain indestructible until your next turn as well. So making two 4-4 four, four angels with flying is uh, pretty strong for 7 mana. And then uh, the indestructible part is a nice bonus as well. And of course this all can also be played as a land instead. Emiria Shattered Skyclave and the mythic rare lands can be played untapped at the cost of 3 life. So they're even better than the other spell lands. So Emiria seems great. Amazing mana sink later in the game if you draw this and don't need a land anymore. But you're still able to play this as a land if necessary. So definitely giving this at least an A. Then we've got Expedition Healer, one and a white for a core cleric at common. And it's a 2-2 with vigilance. And it also has a lifelink as long as you control another cleric. That's a lot of text for a 2-drop at common. So it can potentially be a 2-2 with vigilance and lifelink. And of course we've seen that there's a ton of life gain synergies with the uh, cleric cards. So healer seems like an excellent 2-drop. Definitely worthy of a C+. Then we've got Farsight Adept, 2 and a white for a 3-3 three, three core wizard at common. And when the Adept enters a battlefield, you and target opponent each draw a card. So it is symmetrical, which is neither a drawback nor really an advantage here. It's kind of neutral. Sometimes it's going to benefit you more than the opponent, and vice versa. But the important part here is that we get a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, and it's also wizard in white. White typically doesn't get a ton of wizards, so this is a nice way to fill out your party if you don't have access to blue. So I think the Adept is going to be better than it looks just because of the wizard creature type. And I'm happy giving this a C. Just a fine filler creature, but could potentially end up as a C plus in a deck that cares a ton about the party mechanic. Then we've got Felidar Retreat, 3 and white for an enchantment at rare. And it has a landfall. And then we get to choose between making a 2-2 white cat beast creature token or putting a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. And those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. This card seems amazing if you can trigger landfall consistently. First you can make a couple 2-2 tokens and then you can start pumping the team. Might even see some constructed play, especially if you get access to some fetch lands like Fabled Passage. But for limited it's still... Definitely a difficult card to beat in any game that goes past turn 5 or 6. And do we give Felidar Retreat an S? I don't think I can give it an S, just because it's not a card that can catch you back up if you're behind. If you draw this late and you maybe only have one land to play, then it's not going to be super impactful necessarily. But if you can play this on turn 4 and have 2 or 3 lands left in hand, then this is going to get out of hand very quickly. So definitely an A, maybe even A+. Plus. Very solid rare. Next up we've got Journey to Oblivion. Four and a white for an enchantment at uncommon. Costs one less to cast for each creature in your party. And then when Journey to Oblivion enters the battlefield, you can exile target to non-land permanent and opponent controls until Journey leaves the battlefield. So it's kind of like an Oblivion ring with the uh, party cost reduction attached. 
So if we've got two creatures in our party, cost three mana, that's what we're used to paying for Oblivion Ring. So definitely solid cards, I'll give this one a B. Then we've got Kabira Outrider, three and a white for a 3-3 human warrior at common. And when it enters the battlefield, target creature gets plus one plus one until end of turn for each creature in your party. Yeah, fine playable, nothing too special, probably just a C. Then we've got Fearless Fledgling, one and a white for a 1-1 griffin at uncommon. And it has Landfall, putting a plus one plus one counter on the fledgling and it also gains flying until end of turn. So the fact that this keeps on getting better over time makes it very appealing. It only gains flying with landfall, so it's not consistently going to be a flying creature to pressure the opponent. But uh, it will keep on growing, so even if it doesn't necessarily attack for a ton of damage the first time, the second and third time it's going to hurt a lot more. So Fletchling seems great. I think I'm going up to a B for this. Then we've got a spell land here with Kabira Takedown. So the front half is a 2 mana instant add uncommon that deals damage equal to the number of creatures you control to target creature or planeswalker. And we can also potentially play it as a tapped land. So the flexibility is great and the spell half of the card is pretty serviceable as well. There's no restriction here, the creature doesn't need to be attacking or blocking. You can just take out any creature you want as long as you've got some creatures yourselves. If it was just the spell itself, without the land half, it would probably be a C+. The fact that you get the flexibility of playing it as a land probably pushes it all the way up to a B, maybe B-. minus. Definitely a solid card. Next up we've got Kite Sail Cleric. A 1 mana, 1-1 one, one core cleric at uncommon. It flies and it has kicker for 2 and a white. And if you kick it, then it enters the battlefield and taps up to 2 target creatures. So a nice way to get rid of some blockers. Although it doesn't make the cleric any bigger. Now it is a 1 mana cleric, so again for party purposes this could be pretty strong. So in a hyper aggressive deck that has a lot of party synergies and payoffs, this is probably going to be pretty decent. In a more mid-rangey deck that doesn't have a ton of party stuff going on, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one that can late game tap two creatures down is probably not super appealing. So I think I'm coming down on a C plus for the Kite Sail Cleric. Core Blademaster is one and a white for a 1-1 one, one core warrior at uncommon, and it has double strike, and equipped warriors you control have double strike as well. So this is quite a payoff for the whole equipment and warrior deck. This is a card that might make me want to play the Switchblade, the uh, one mana equipment that moves around for three mana and gives plus one plus one. Because if you get plus one plus one and double strike, then all of a sudden you're dealing a ton of damage. So the Blade Master, definitely a build around card. If you don't have any equipment, it's still a 2 mana 1-1 one, one double strike that plays well with other pump spells. So the floor on the Blade Master is not too low, but the ceiling can be incredibly high. So I think I'm willing to give this a B. Next up we've got Core Celebrant, 2 and a white for a 1-4 Core Cleric. And whenever Celebrant or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. So one-sided Soul Warden. Yeah, this uh, seems decent in the Cleric decks that care about gaining life. Outside of it, probably not amazing. Maybe in a more controlling deck if you just need some blockers. So not every deck is going to want this, but in the Cleric Synergy deck it's probably pretty strong. So we'll give this one a C. A Legion Angel, 4 mana for a 4-3 Angel Warrior at rare, and it has flying, and when Legion Angel enters the battlefield you may reveal a card you own named Legion Angel from outside the game and put it into your hand. So for limited, it's not going to be super relevant since getting two copies of this in draft is unlikely, and I think even if you get two copies in draft you're probably still playing both in the main deck since a 4 mana 4-3 flyer is pretty strong in limited. 
For constructed, things get a lot more interesting. Do you play two in the main, two in the side, one in the main, three in the side? That's probably the split that's going to be the most interesting. But for limited, a 4 mana 4 3 flyer is still pretty good. So I'm giving this one a B. Next up, we've got a Luminarch Aspirant, one in a white for a 1 1 human cleric at rare. Saying at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. No restriction. Can put it on the Aspirant itself, can put it on a different creature. Works great with double strike, of course. So the Aspirant seems amazing. And the fact that it triggers at the beginning of combat means that at the very least, this is a 2 mana 2 2, since you can just put the counter on itself. So, yeah, Aspirant seems great. I think I'm going all the way up to an A, just because of how cheap and impactful the card is, and it's just gonna keep on putting more counters on your creatures as the game goes on. So it kind of has to be answered immediately. Yeah, this card's great. Might even see some constructed play. Then we've got Makin the Ox, for and a white, for a 4-4 Ox at common, and Landfall lets you tap target creature an opponent controls. So not one of the more exciting landfall creatures, but it's a fine curve topper for the more aggressive landfall decks and will help you push through a lot of damage. So what do we give the ox? Of course, the more expensive the landfall cards, the less likely you are to have a bunch of lands in hand to play afterwards. So that also factors in here. So probably just give the ox a C playable card, but not every deck is going to want it. So yeah, McKinney Ox doesn't have a land side. But McKinney Stampede, 5 mana, uncommon sorcery, gives creatures you control plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. And then you can also play it as a land if you want instead, which is the McKinney Mesas, which enters the battlefield tapped. So having your overrun also be a land is pretty nice, because these cards tend to be a little conditional if you're not ahead on board or if you don't have a nice board presence to uh, leverage the plus two plus two effect then it's possible you might need a land instead and then if you draw this in a late game it's going to be a great way to close out the game so stampede seems pretty strong willing to give this one a c plus then we've got a mall of the skyclaves Two and a white for an artifact equipment at rare, and when a Mall of the Skyclave enters the battlefield, you can attach it to a creature right away, giving it plus two plus two, flying and first strike. That's a lot of abilities. And then the equip cost is pretty pricey for two and double white, but of course you get to equip it right away the first time you play it. So yeah, this seems like a pretty strong equipment that's eventually gonna close out a game if you don't run out of creatures first, that is. But assuming you've got a decent amount of creatures in the deck, this is going to be very hard to beat in a long game. So yeah, I think I'm okay giving this one an A. Just a very powerful equipment. Mesa Lynx, one and a white for a 2-1 cat. And as long as it's not your turn, it gets two additional toughness. So 2-1 on offense and a 2-3 on defense. Pretty strange for a white card since those typically tend to be more aggressive. Not necessarily a huge fan of the Lynx, but uh, I mean it's definitely playable if you need a curve filler at 2 mana. I'll give this one a D, but uh, might end up being surprised by it. Nahiri's Binding, 1 and double white for an enchantment aura at common, enchants a creature or planeswalker. And then Enchanted Permanence can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can be activated. So this one's double wide, but it can also be put on Planeswalkers, which is the main difference here. Yeah, this card's decent. I mean, it's a common removal spell in white for 3 mana, takes care of anything, pretty much. So Binding seems uh, like one of the best commons in white so far. Definitely giving this one a B. And then we've got another land that can be played as a spell. And the spell half is Undo Inversion, 8 mana for a sorcery at rare, destroying all non-land permanents. Now 8 mana is expensive, that's usually half of your lands in a normal limited deck. 
Also, the spell lands in Zanikar do change that equation a little bit. But of course, you can always just play it out as a land that enters the battlefield tapped. And then if you do find yourself in a late game with 8 mana, and you're behind on boards, then having access to the inversion is going to be pretty strong. So what do we give the card as a whole? Don't think I'm going all the way up to an A, just because 8 mana is still a lot. But uh, it's a nice get out of jail free card at times, so probably can go below a B. Next up we've got Parrot Tactician, 2 and a white for a 3-2 Human Warrior add uncommon. And when a Tactician and at least one other Warrior attack, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Parrot Tactician. Doesn't seem too difficult to attack with another Warrior, and this can also get out of hand very quickly. Especially if you've got some evasive creatures or maybe ways of uh, enhancing the Tactician, give it flying or first strike, and all of a sudden it's very difficult for the opponent to block. So a Tactician seems like a very solid card, at the very least a C+, but might end up overperforming if you've got enough ways to uh, get the first couple counters on it. Then we've got Practiced Tactics, single white for an instant at common. You can choose target attacking or blocking creature, and Tactics deals damage to that creature equal to twice the number of creatures in your party. So without any creatures in your party, this card does nothing. With one creature in your party, it's two damage, so it's kind of like a slash of talents. With two creatures, it's pretty strong. Four damage for just one mana. And it shouldn't be too difficult to have at least one or two creatures in your party. So tactics seems pretty strong. If the format ends up being very aggressive, then this might even be better than the three mana pacifism we've seen earlier. I'll end up uh, on C plus for tactics. Start out with a more conservative rating, but uh, yeah, this could end up being the better of the white removal spells. Next up we've got pressure points, reprinted a few times in the meantime. So one and a white for an instant that taps a creature and then draws a card. So it can never be too bad, but it's also never amazing. So probably just give this a C. Fine filler card, but nothing special. Prowling Felidar, 3 and a white for a cat beast at common, and it's a 2-3 Vigilance with Landfall, putting a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. Whenever Landfall can put a plus 1 counter instead of just giving a temporary bonus, it definitely has my attention. And it's no different here, a 2-3 that can quickly become a 3-4, then a 4-5 Vigilance, can play offense and defense nicely. At the very least, a C plus could even see it getting in the B minus territory. Then we've got a resolute strike, single white for an instant, giving plus two plus two until end of turn. And if the targeted creature is a warrior, it can also receive an equipment we control. So, in the warrior aggro deck where you've got presumably a few equipment, resolute strike is going to be a neat little comma trick. If you don't have any warriors or equipment whatsoever, one mana for plus two plus two is nothing special. So it's a fine trick. Don't rate it particularly highly, probably just a C. Then we've got Seagate Bannerets, single white for a core warrior at common. It's a one two and for five mana, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn. So it's a 1 mana warrior for party purposes, and then later in the game it's a reasonable mana sink. So in the party decks, or the warrior decks, this is going to be a fine 1 drop, but uh, probably still not a card you take too highly. So I'll just give this one a C, fine filler. Then we've got another spell land here. Sejiri Shelter is one and white for an instant at uncommon, and target creature you control gains protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. So, nice way to protect a key creature. A nice way to memorize what protection does is with that, D-E-B-T. D stands for preventing damage. E stands for preventing enchanting or equipping, and there are a few colored equipments in the set. 
So protection can also potentially prevent an equipment from being uh, attached to a creature. B stands for blocking, so blocking prevents or protection prevents a creature from the chosen color of uh, blocking. And then T stands for targeting, so a creature with protection can be targeted by a spell of the chosen color. And then you can always play it as a tap land as well, so a nice versatile card that I'm uh, happy giving a C+. Then we've got Shepherd of Heroes for the white for a 3-4 Angel Cleric at common with flying, and when it enters the battlefield you gain 2 life for each creature in your party. So at the very least it's going to gain you 2 life thanks to the Cleric, assuming the Shepherd is still in play by the time the ability resolves. If the opponent can kill this in response you don't gain any life potentially. But it uh, shouldn't be too difficult to gain 2 for life. And then 5 mana for a 3-4 flyer is not a bad deal. So yeah, definitely giving this a C+. Then we've got Skyclave Apparition, 1 and double white for a core spirit at rare. It's a 2-2 two -two, and when the apparition enters the battlefield you can exile up to 1 target non-land, non-token permanent you don't control with converted mana cost 4 or less. And when the apparition leaves the battlefield the exiled cards Owner creates an XX blue illusion creature token where X is the converted mana cost of the exiled card. So a 2-2 two -two that can act as removal, but if they can get rid of the apparition the opponent still gets an illusion token back, but they don't get the exiled creature back, so that one stays gone forever. And it's not even necessarily a creature, it says non-land, non-token permanent, so that also includes enchantments or equipment. So definitely a solid card. If the opponent can't get rid of the apparition, then it's just a removal spell that leaves behind a 2-2 body. Now it is a core spirit, so the creature types aren't especially relevant for party purposes, but it's still a powerful rare. So yeah, probably give apparition a B, just a fine card and a nice versatile removal spell slash creature. Then we've got Skyclave Cleric, one and white for a 1-3 core cleric that when it enters the battlefield gains 2 life. And it's an uncommon that can also be played as a tap land. So it's not a very high impact creature, a 1-3 that gains a bit of life. Not especially amazing, but it does punish 2-1 creatures on offense pretty nicely. And of course a cleric is nice for party purposes and the life gain can be nice for some cleric synergies as well. So again, these uh, spell land creatures can be rated too low because you've got a ton of flexibility with them, but this one also can never be too amazing. So what do we give Skyclave Cleric? Probably a C plus. Don't think I can just give this one a C but uh, definitely not the best of these we've seen. Next up we've got Squad Commander, 4 mana for a 3-3 Core Warrior at rare, and when the commander enters the battlefield you get to make a 1-1 white Core Warrior creature token for each creature in your party, and assuming the commander lives it's going to be at least one token. So we get 4 power and 4 toughness at the very least, and at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, creatures you control get plus one plus so and indestructible until end of turn. So if you ever get to a full party, this is gonna close out the game very quickly. But even if you just have two or three creatures in your party and make a few tokens, this card seems great. B plus A minus territory. Don't know if I can quite give this one a, a full A. Seems a bit much, but definitely at least a B plus. Then we've got another reprint here, Smite a Monstrous, 3 and white, for an instant that destroys target creature with power 4 or greater. So we haven't seen a ton of enormous creatures so far, but of course we haven't seen too many green creatures yet. So there's gonna be probably a few targets in every deck at least, so main decking one is probably gonna be reasonably safe. But it's a card that you can easily sideboard out or sideboard in additional copies based on what you see from the opponents. And a lot of the 
creatures with landfall eventually turn into four powered creatures. So the fact that this is, an, this is an instant also means you can potentially kill a creature in the opponent's turn after it gets the bonus from landfall. So Smite the Monstrous, fine card. Usually going to be happy with the first copy. Somewhere between a C and a C+. Plus. I'll start out more conservative and just give this one a C because it is somewhat conditional in nature and I don't imagine you want more than one copy. But uh, definitely a fine playable. Then we've got Tazim Raptor, 2 and a white for a 2-2 bird at common. It has flying and when a raptor enters a battlefield you may return a land you control to its owner's hand. This is a may ability so definitely no obligation to return a land. So it's pure upside if you want to return a land for landfall purposes or maybe you played a tap land earlier that can be played as a spell later. So a raptor seems pretty decent. C plus, fine enabler for landfall as well. And then our final white card, I believe, is a Tansri Beacon of Unity for a white for a mythic rare, a legendary human warrior that costs one less to cast for each creature in your party. So with a full party, it could potentially cost a single white mana for a 4-6. And then we've got a very colorful activated ability, letting us look at the top six cards of our library, reveal up to two cleric, rogue, warrior, wizard, and or ally cards from among them, and put them into your hand. And the rest goes on the bottom in a random order. Don't think we've seen any ally cards in a set so far. But uh, yeah, a nice way to generate a bit of card advantage if you've got some spare mana. Assuming you're a two-color deck, the activated ability is going to cost seven mana. So it's still quite pricey. If you're at least three colors, it can potentially just cost uh, five mana. So it's still expensive. You're probably not going to activate it too much. But just evaluating this as a cheap 4-6 potentially, it's not too bad. So what do we give Tansri Beacon of Unity? Probably a B+. Plus. Don't know if I can go all the way to an A. Maybe in the kind of five color green deck where you've got a ton of mana fixing and it's easier to use the activated ability. It's going to be a little easier on the mana. But I assume that if you're playing the multicolor green deck where you've got a ton of mana fixing, you're not necessarily going to have a ton of creature types for the party mechanic. So then playing Tansri is going to be pretty pricey and the ability is not going to be all that amazing. So, yeah, you're either playing Tansri in a party deck where uh, activating the ability is going to be difficult, or you're playing Tansri in a deck that can easily activate the ability, but then there's not going to be a ton of creatures to find with the ability. So I don't think it's ever going to be incredible in Limited, but it's never going to be terrible either, so probably just give this one a B, B+. All right, and that's all the white cards covered. Anti-Cognition, one in a blue for an instant, that counters target creature or planeswalker spell unless its controller pays two mana. And if an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, instead counter that spell and then scry two as well. If you're not playing a deck that's good at milling the opponents, this is a quench that only counters creatures or planeswalkers. But if you are playing a deck that can reliably fill the opponent's graveyard, it turns into a pretty powerful Essence Scatter type card that even lets you scry too. So this one's uh, probably going to vary pretty heavily based on the rest of your deck. So the fact that it doesn't counter instants and sorceries is not as bad as uh, not being able to counter creatures. Overall, Anticognition, probably just giving this one a C, but in the very dedicated mill decks where you can quickly fill the opponent's graveyard, it could go up to a C+. Next up, we have another spell land here with Bane Veil, vale, one and a blue for an instant, giving all creatures the opponent controls minus two, minus so until end of turn. Well, this is definitely very high impact, Comotric, if you can line up some good blocks, this can be quite a blowout. And then you can always just play it as a tap land instead. So the opportunity cost is pretty low. 
and the payoff is potentially quite high. You do need a bit of a board presence for this to shine and then the opponent does need to make a pretty big attack for this to be a blowout. But uh, yeah, card seems okay. Okay, giving this a C+. Plus. Bubble Snare is a single blue for an aura that enchants a creature. And when Bubble Snare enters the battlefield, if it was kicked for two and a blue, you can tap Enchanted Creature, and the Enchanted Creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So for four mana, it's essentially a capture sphere without flash, and you do have the flexibility of just playing it for single blue mana to keep a creature tapped down. It's pretty good in a racing situation if the opponent's creature doesn't have vigilance. If the opponent has a big blocker on defense, it's going to be a little pricey to get rid of it. But 4 mana still does the job for the most part. So Bubble Snare seems decent. We'll go with B, B- for Bubble Snare. Then we've got Cascade Seer, 3 and a blue for a Merfolk Wizard at common. And when the Seer enters the battlefield, you get to Scry X, where X is the number of creatures in your party. So 4 mana, 3-3. Three, three that scry 1 when it enters the battlefield, assuming it survives when the trigger resolves, is not amazing, but also not the worst. And then as soon as you get scry 2, scry 3, you start getting into some pretty interesting territory. So overall, probably just give this one a C, but in a deck with a lot of party synergy, it could go up to a C+. Plus. The Raging Isle, 2 and double blue for a legendary Leviathan Crab. Saying, spells your opponents cast at the target's Carrix cost 2 more to cast. And for 3 mana, Carrix gets plus X, minus X on the end of turn, where X is the number of islands you control. And it's a 0, 17. That's a lot of toughness. So, assuming... By the time you play Carrix, you've got three islands. By the time you can attack with it, maybe four islands. Give this one four additional power, turn it into a 4-13. Makes it very difficult uh, for the opponent to block this profitably if they don't have Death Touch. And of course it's a house on defense that no one is going to get past. And then once you get to the very late game and you've got six or seven islands in play, this can close out the game in just a few attacks. So yeah, Carrix seems pretty strong. Um, memes aside, probably give this one a B plus. Then we've got Chilling Trap, single blue for an instant. Target creature gets minus four minus zero until end of turn, and if you control a wizard, to draw a card. Well, this seems amazing if you are in the wizard deck. A cantrip for one mana. That also shrinks down an opposing creature. It's going to be a blowout. So outside of the wizard deck, of course, this is pretty bad. But in the wizard deck, this is going to be a C+. So overall, probably land on a C for Chilling Trap. Then we've got Cleric of Chill Depths. One on a blue for a 1-3 Merfolk Cleric. Whenever a Cleric of Chill Depths blocks a creature, that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So it's a pretty annoying blocker for some of the more aggressive decks that have a lot of X1 creatures. Um, and can even keep something bigger tapped down for an extra turn. It is a Cleric in blue, so once again, kind of spotting these creature types that are unusual for their color is important. Don't see too many clerics in blue usually, so that does have some additional upside for the party mechanic. So overall, probably give this one a C. Nothing amazing, but the cleric type in blue probably makes it better than it looks. Then we've got Concerted Defense. Single blue instant add on common, countering target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one, plus an additional one for each creature in your party. Yeah, this doesn't seem amazing for limited. Maybe in a very dedicated party deck you want one copy of this, but it's probably more of a sideboard card if the opponent has some very expensive non-creature spells you want to counter. 
So we'll give this one a D. Confounding Conundrum, one and a blue for an enchantment at a rare. When it enters a battlefield, you get to draw a card. And whenever a land enters a battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player has another land enter a battlefield under their control this turn, they have to return a land they control to its owner's hand. So it's kind of like an anti-ramp card. Don't think this is going to be relevant for limited, but might have some constructed applications. And uh, giving the opponent a land back in their hand can also potentially be a downside if the opponent's playing some landfall cards. So for limited, I mean, I guess it draws a card, so it can't be too bad, but uh, yeah, it doesn't really have any relevant text. So not sure if I'm supposed to give this an F or a D, but... Yeah, it's probably not going to make the deck very often. Then we have Coral Helm Chronicler, 2 and a blue for a Merfolk Wizard at a rare. It's a 2-2, two -two, and whenever you cast a Kicked spell, you get to draw a card and then discard a card. And when a Chronicler enters a battlefield, you can look at the top 5 cards of your library, reveal a card with a Kicker ability from among them, and put it into your hand, the rest on the bottom in a random order. So in a Kicker-heavy deck, this is... A bit of card advantage, followed by some card selection. 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, nothing too exciting. So yeah, in a deck that doesn't have any kicker spells, this is not really playable. In a deck with anywhere upwards from 5 kicker spells, this is probably going to be pretty decent. Yeah, you do have to have quite a few kicker cards for this to be worth it. Alright, we'll go all the way to C+, for the Chronicler. Cunning, a Geyser Mage, 2 and a blue for a Human Wizard. It's a 3-2 at common. And it has Kicker for 2 and a blue. When the Mage enters a battlefield, if it was kicked, you can return up to one other target creature to its owner's hand. So a 3-mana three 3-2 three or a 6-mana 3-2 that can uh, bounce an opposing creature. So pretty pricey if you want to get the bounce effect. But the fail case is a 3-mana three 3-2 three wizard, so can potentially work well with those wizard synergies. Yeah, it's not amazing, probably just a C, but definitely a playable card. Deliberate, one on the blue for an instant, that lets you scry two and then draw a card. So we get an instant speed preordain, but it costs us 2 mana. You know, as far as cantrips go, this isn't the worst. Um, so in the wizard deck that cares about casting plenty of instants and sorceries, this is fine. If you don't have a ton of two drops, this can fill out your curve and maybe smooth out your draws. So it's fine, probably just a C. Expedition Diviner, 3 and a blue for a 3 to merfolk wizard at common that flies, and as long as you control another wizard, it has the ability, when this creature dies, you get to draw a card. I mean, 4 mana 3-2 flyer is playable. And then the additional ability makes it pretty decent. So, yeah, I'm into the Diviner. Probably C+. Field Research, 2 and a blue for a Sorcery at common. That lets you draw 2 cards, and if it's kicked, you get to draw 3 cards instead. But the kicker cost is an additional 2 and a blue. So, it's Divination, or it's a 6 mana Sorcery Speed, draw 3. So, you know, Divination varies in playability. In some formats it's actively good, other formats it's barely playable. So far, I'm not getting the impression that the format is incredibly aggressive. So Divination is probably a fine card, and this is just strictly better than Divination, as you get the flexibility of kicking it. So, I'll give Field Research a C plus as a hopeful vote here. And hopefully we get to cast plenty of these in Limited. A Glacial Grasp, 2 and a blue for an instant. That taps target creature, and its controller mills 2 cards, and that creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step, and you get to draw a card. So it replaces itself, you get to mill 2, and you get to lock down a creature. So this is another one of those cards that's going to be quite useful for the blue-black rogue mill deck, where you want to make sure the opponent has 
a full graveyard. So not only does it prevent the damage for one turn, but potentially two turns as a creature doesn't untap. So I think Glacial Grasp's pretty solid, a nice tempo play. Probably worthy of a C, maybe even C+. Then we've got a Glass Pool Mimic, two and a blue, for a Shapeshifter Rogue at rare. It's a 0-0, but you may have the Mimic enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature you control, except it's a Shapeshifter Rogue in addition to its other types. So it only copies your own creatures, which is why it only costs 3 mana when we're used to paying 4 mana for these clone effects. But then it does also have the flexibility of uh, being played as a land. I guess the land is missing here, but it's just going to be a tap land as all the other non-mythic spell lands. So yeah, Glass Pool Mimic, reasonable clone effect. Pretty cheap, it's also rogue for any rogue synergies, and uh, it keeps a rogue creature type after it's done copying something. The major appeal of clone effects is typically that if the opponent is the one with the biggest creature in play, you get to copy that instead. So you can at least try and maybe trade for the opposing creature. Can't quite do that with a mimic, but it does cost only 3 mana. Not sure if this gets into the B range because of that limitation, if you're behind on board this potentially does nothing if you don't have anything to copy. So I think I'm leaning C plus on Mimic as opposed to B. Then we've got Inscription of Insight, 3 and a blue for a sorcery. At rare, and it has Kicker for 2 and double blue. And you get to choose one. If the spell was kicked, you choose any number instead. Between returning up to two target creatures to their owner's hands, Scry Tooth and Draw Two, and target player creates an XX blue illusion creature token where X is the number of cards in their hand. Now it is a sorcery, so 4 mana for scry to draw 2 is like okay, nothing exciting. 4 mana to return 2 creatures is potentially a decent tempo play if those creatures were expensive. And then making an XX illusion token Probably not going to be amazing, assuming you don't have too many cards in hand at that point. But if you do get to kick it, it's going to be pretty strong. You get to draw cards and then make an illusion that's going to be too bigger, since you're drawing two extra cards. And you get to bounce two things. But of course, that is eight mana total, so it's very expensive. And I guess if you're playing this for eight mana, you probably don't have too many more cards in hand. So the illusion is probably just going to be like a 2-2 or a 3-3. Expensive, but powerful if you can kick it. And of course you get the versatility of all three modes, even at 4 mana. So overall, I'll probably give this a B. Then we have a reprint of Into the Royal. One on a blue for an instant, returns target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. And if the spell was kicked, you get to draw a card. So kicker is one on a blue, 4 mana total. So it's essentially a reprint of Blink of an Eye, which uh, is a great card. C plus B minus territory. A great interaction to have at just two mana, and then hopefully you can usually kick it so you get the card back. So yeah, definitely a nice one. Then we've got Jace, Mer Mage, one and double blue for a mythic rare Jace Planeswalker that starts out at 4 loyalty. And it also has kicker for 2 mana. And if it was kicked, you get to make a token that's a copy of Jace, except it's not legendary. And it only has 1 starting loyalty. And then plus 1 lets us cry 2, and the 0 ability lets us draw a card to reveal it, and remove loyalty equal to that card's converted mana cost. So very interesting card to play with and against. Gives you a ton of options with your sequencing. Do you plus one the Jace with a low loyalty or do you use a zero ability? And then of course, if you see an expensive card with the Scry 2, you can maybe sacrifice your low loyalty Jace to draw that card. Or maybe you can put a land on top to keep your two Jaces alive. So definitely seems like a very fun card to uh, play with. 
and uh, it's also pretty powerful. Now, this is probably a card that gets better the older the format is, as typically the converted mana costs go down, but in limited, it's still going to be pretty decent, giving you a ton of card selection and a few extra cards along the way. And Planeswalkers tend to have pretty high impact on games of limited, as some people tend to overreact to try and get rid of them, potentially uh, losing a lot of creatures in the process. So yeah, Jace is pretty good. Probably land on an A for Jace, just because of the versatility and card advantage possibilities. Next up we've got Jwari Disruption, one in a blue for an instant that counters target spell unless its controller pays one. So kind of like a sensor, but then instead of cycling it we have the flexibility of playing it as a land. Looks like the land half is missing here too, but once again it's just a tap land, so... Yeah, fine uh, cheap counter spell. This is probably one of the counter spells you'll have to play around if the opponent's keeping up two mana early in the game. And uh, pretty happy giving this C. Living Tempest, four and a blue for an elemental at common. And it's a 3 3 with flash and flying. So we've seen this similar stats before. I believe it was in uh, Ixalan where there was a 3-3 Flash Merfolk with flying. So, yeah, pretty decent card. And another card you'll have to keep in mind if the opponent's keeping up a bunch of mana, including blue. And uh, plays well alongside other instants, like counter spells, of course, giving you the flexibility of using a counter spell. And if you don't have to, you can just flash in the Tempest instead. So C plus seems fitting. Then we've got Lol Mage's Domination, X and Triple Blue for a Sorcery at Uncommon. And it costs 3 less to cast if it targets a creature whose controller has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, and you gain control of target creature with converted mana cost X. So let's say you want to steal the opponent's 3 drop, it's going to cost you 6 mana, which is pretty pricey, but if they have 8 or more cards in graveyard, it's only 3 mana to steal their 3 drop. So. Powerful effect, but the mana cost might be prohibitive based on how many cards the opponent has in their graveyard. In the dedicated mill deck, this is probably a B. In a deck without any specific mill cards, this is probably closer to a C+. But definitely gonna make the cut in most blue decks. Then we've got Maddening Cacophony, one in the blue for a sorcery at rare saying each opponent mills 8 cards, and if we kick it for an additional 3 in a blue, we can instead mill half of the opponent's library, round it up instead. So this is a way to enable all those cards that care about having 8 or more cards in the opponent's graveyard, and let's say we're playing an average game of limited. 6 mana means we're probably around turn 6, turn 7, turn 8. So the opponent might have around uh, 20 to 25 cards in their library. So if we kick this, then we're milling around 12 to 13 cards. Playing this for the kicker is not that much different from just playing it for 2 mana, all things considered. I don't think we're going to be playing this simply as a win condition, since we probably need a few more mill effects for that to work. But it is a cheap way to enable a lot of the cards that care about the opponent having a certain number of cards in their uh, graveyard. And then the question is how many of those payoffs do you have? If you only have one or two payoffs then this is probably not worth it, but if you have a deck that's chock full of those effects, then having a two mana enabler, even if it's not necessarily worth the card, could be worth it in the end. Of course it is a rare, so it's not easy to get multiples of these and reliably mill the opponent out. We've seen quite a few payoffs for the mill cards already, so this could easily end up being better than expected. I'll start out with a more conservative C plus for Cacophony, but this could be one of those cards that ends up overperforming. Then we've got Master of Winds, two and a double blue for a 1-4. Sphinx Wizard at rare that flies, and when it enters the battlefield you get to draw two and then discard a card. 
so you're netting an extra card. And then whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard spell, you may have Master of Winds, base power and toughness become 4-1 or 1-4 until end of turn. So this can potentially hit pretty hard if it can get in for 4 consistently. It flies, so it's difficult to block. And if the opponent doesn't have instant speed removal, then uh, yeah, they're going to take a ton of damage. So this card seems great, provides card advantage when it enters the battlefield. So I think I'm willing to give this one an A. Then we've got Merfolk Falconer, 3 and double blue for a 4-4 four four Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon. It has flying, and when you cast a kicked spell, you get to scry two. I mean, 5 mana for a 4 flyer is quite solid, and then the extra ability makes it even better, so I think I'm okay giving Falconer B, B plus even. Just a very solid card, and especially in the kicker deck, presumably blue-green, you might have a bit of ramp to get the Falconer out there a turn ahead of schedule. Merfolk Wind Robber, single blue for a 1 1 Merfolk Rogue with flying. And when the Wind Robber deals comma damage to a player, that player mills a card. And then you can also sacrifice the Merfolk to draw a card, but you can only activate this if an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard. Now it is a Rogue, so that does help for your party. 1 1 Flyer. It's a nice, cheap, evasive creature. Probably helps you mill a couple cards from the opponent, and then turns on your other synergies, so... Yeah, this is an interesting one. Pretty poor top deck if you don't have an opponent with 8 or more cards in Graveyard. But a pretty strong turn 1 play, presumably. I think I'm okay giving this a C+. And of course a cheap way to fill your party. Negate, reprinted, 2 mana instant, counters target non-creature spell. Usually more of a sideboard card, but every now and then it can sneak into the main deck. So this is probably just a D, but uh, some decks might main deck it still. Nimble Trap Finder, 1 in the blue for a human rogue at rare. It's a 2-1, and the Trap Finder can be blocked if you had another Cleric, Rogue, Warrior, or Wizard enter the battlefield under your control this turn, and at the beginning of combats. If you have a full party, creatures you control gain whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card until end of turn. Kind of ignoring the full party here, 2 mana for a 2-1, that can potentially become unblockable for a turn. It's okay. It's a human rogue itself, so it's one part of the party. Still not amazing, but probably still a C+. Then we've got a Risen Riptide. Two and a blue for an elemental at common. And whenever you cast a kicked spell, a Risen Riptide has base power and toughness 5-5 five, five until end of turn. And normally it's just an 0-5. So this only really wants to go into the kicker synergy deck. And in that deck, this can be quite a payoff. 5-5 five, five is no joke. And then 0-5 oh, in the meantime can still play defense quite well. So, kind of like the cards for the kicker decks. But of course it's one specific deck out of multiple viable archetypes. So, it's not a card that every deck is going to want. So, the kicker decks should be able to pick one of these up if they want it. Probably just give this a C. Roost of Drakes, single blue for an enchantment and uncommon. And when a Roost of Drakes enters a battlefield, if it was kicked for two and a blue, you get to make a 2 2 blue Drake creature token with flying. And whenever you cast a kicked spell, you get to make a 2 2 Drake creature token with flying as well. So a nice payoff for the kicker deck once again. And a 2 2 Drake token with flying is definitely a big deal. Doesn't take many of those to end the game. So. Yeah, Rooster Drake seems pretty decent, depending on how easy it is to kick spells, although we've seen most kicker spells be pretty expensive, so you're kind of looking at at least 5 or 6 mana before you can kick spells, so I expect Rooster Drakes to be kicked itself most of the time, because it's not like you're going to play this on turn 1 and then start kicking spells on turn 2 already. So overall, Rooster Drakes, probably a C+. Since uh, the kicker cards are pretty expensive, 
If we had more cheap kicker cards, then this could easily be B plus A territory. But uh, that's not really the formats we're living in. Then we've got a Ruin Crab, single blue for an uncommon crab. And Landfall mills three cards from the opponents. So a nice O3 blocker that can mill the opponents. Another way to enable some of those rogue synergies. And uh, yeah, solid little card. Get a few of these and you can just win the game by milling the opponents. Yeah, I like the Rune Crab for the blue mill decks. Probably give this a C plus as well. And then we've seen this one before, Seagate Restoration. 7 mana Mythic Rare Sorcery. That lets you draw cards equal to the number of cards in your hands, plus one. And then you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. And you can also play it out as a, a lance at the cost of three life that enters battlefield untapped. So, you know, it's an expensive effect for limited, but you do get the flexibility of just playing out a land, even untapped if you want to. And playing a land untapped can sometimes be worth three life, if that means playing your three drop on curve. This is probably going to be replacing a land as opposed to some of the spells that are more likely to just be spells in the deck. This is more likely to just be played as a land. But let's say you play this as a spell once every, I don't know, five games. Then it could make the difference. So overall, probably give this one a C+. Probably a card you include in most blue decks. And every now and then you'll get the benefit from the spell half. Then we've got Seagate Stormcaller, one and a blue for a Mythic Rare Human Wizard. It's a 2-1, and the kicker is 4 and a blue. And when the Stormcaller enters the battlefield, you can copy the next instant or sorcery spell with CMC 2 or less that you cast this turn when you cast it. And if it was kicked, you can copy that spell twice instead and choose new targets for the copies. Kicking this seems pretty difficult if you also need to play one or two mana spell alongside it. Yeah, this seems pretty tricky to make work in limited. But uh, probably still a C plus. Like, getting a little bit of value doesn't seem too difficult. Then we've got Seafloor Stalker, two and a blue, for a 2-3 Merfolk Rogue. And... For 4 and a blue, the Stalker gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn and cannot be blocked. And it costs 1 less to activate this ability for each creature in your party. The Rogue is nothing amazing at uh, 3 mana here. But the ability does give you a way to potentially close out the game. And you can potentially activate the ability multiple times if you somehow have multiple party members in play. Although that's probably not going to come up too often. In games where board stalls are prevalent, then Stalker can be a nice finisher. In most normal games of limited, this is probably just a C, like a fine filler creature, but nothing special. Then we've got Shell Shield, single blue for an instant. Target creature you control gets plus O plus 3 until end of turn. And if this was kicked, that creature also gains Hexproof until end of turn. Kicker cost is only a single mana. So this could potentially be a nice way to get some drake tokens out of the roost. But uh, overall, we're used to playing Dive Down, which gives both the additional toughness and hexproof for one mana. Here we have to spend one additional mana. Yeah, I mean, it's a combo trick if you need a combo trick. Doesn't pump power. It's strictly a defensive trick. So I'm not the biggest fan, but it does have kicker in case you've got some kicker synergies. So probably still a C. And then we've got another spell land here with Selundi Vision, two and a blue for an instant at uncommon, letting you take a look at the top six cards of your library, reveal an instant or sorcery, put it into your hands, and the rest goes on the bottom. Nothing special, it doesn't even provide card advantage, just replaces itself, but it does have the flexibility of just being played as a land, I suppose. But most limited decks don't have a ton of instants and sorceries, so there's also a chance you just end up missing. I don't know, not the biggest fan of this one. Probably just a C. 
Then we've got Skyclave Plunder for a blue for a sorcery at uncommon, letting you take a look at the top X cards of your library where X is 3 plus the number of creatures in your party, and you can put 3 of those cards into your hand and the rest goes on the bottom. So assuming no party members, this is 5 mana draw 3, and then any additional party members makes this quite a bit better. So it is expensive card draw, but it is a nice way to pull ahead if there's any sort of board stall going on. So happy to give Skyclave Plunder a B, but you have to be careful not to play too many of these do nothing card draw effects. But having a few can make the difference. Skyclave Squid is a 2 mana 3 2 squid at common with defender and landfall essentially removes defender until end of turn. So 2 mana 3 2 can trade nicely and then being able to attack as a 3 powered creature is pretty nice. So I like the squid. Definitely at least a C. Potentially a C plus as just a nice way to trade up for the opponent's more expensive creatures. Then we've got Sure-Footed Infiltrator, 3 and a blue for a Merfolk Rogue at Uncommon. It's a 2-3 and you can tap another untapped Rogue you control. And then the Infiltrator cannot be blocked this turn. And whenever it deals comma damage to a player you get to draw a card. So our typical Ophidian ability here. And yeah, we've seen some pretty cheap Rogues in blue at 1 and 2 mana. So if you can tap one of those cheaper Rogues to let the Infiltrator through, then you can get a steady stream of card advantage while getting in 2 damage each turn. So, yeah, I'm a fan of the Infiltrator. 4 mana 2-3 is nothing to write home about, but if you can consistently use the ability, then it's going to be pretty solid. So, C plus seems appropriate here. Tazim Royal Mage, 1 and a blue for a Merfolk Wizard at common. It's a 2-1, and it has Kicker for 4 mana, and if you kicked it, then when it enters the battlefield you get to return an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. So very similar to Gi to Chronicler. Costs 6 mana total. Instead of getting a 1-3, we get a 2-1 Merfolk Wizard. So, yeah, pretty decent card. Uh, depends kind of how good a 2-1 creature is going to be. So far we've seen a few ways to punish we've seen a few ways to punish these one toughness creatures, seen a couple one threes already. So those could potentially be problematic for a card like this. But of course if you can reliably kick this in the late game, you're getting some nice value and then just kinda a free two one on top. It's also a wizard for two mana to enable party shenanigans, so yeah, seems fine. C plus. Thieving Skydiver, 1 and a blue for a Merfolk Rogue at rare. It's a 2-1 flyer. And it has Kicker X, but X cannot be 0. And when a Skydiver enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, you gain control of target artifacts with converted mana cost X or less. And if it's an equipment, you can attach it to the Skydiver right away. We've covered all the artifacts. There's not a ton of them, but probably enough that you'll probably encounter an artifact once every two games, I would guess. And the fail case here is a 2 mana 2-1 two flyer, which is still quite solid. So the kicker is just pure upside. So Skydiver can probably receive a B. Then we've got another spell land with Umaira Wizard, 4 in the blue, for a 4-3 Merfolk Wizard at Uncommon saying whenever you cast an instant, sorcery or wizard, then the Umara wizard gains flying until end of turn. So 5 mana for 4-3 four, four, that occasionally gains flying. Pretty decent considering we can always play it out as a tap land as well. So I like C plus for Umara wizard. Then we've got Windrider wizard. 2 and a blue for an uncommon human wizard. That's a 2-2 flyer, saying whenever you cast an instant, sorcery or wizard, you can draw a card and if you do, discard a card. So a 2-2 flyer that lets us loot if the condition is met. So the fail case is never too bad and uh, can potentially provide nice bit of card selection as well. So 
I'll give this a similar rating to the previous Tutu Flyer with upsides, which I believe we give a C+. Zulaport Duelist, single blue for a human rogue at common, is a 1-1 one -one with flash, so we can play that instant speed. And when it enters the battlefield, up to one target creature gets minus two minus zero oh until end of turn, and its controller mills two cards. So a nice little combo trick, reminiscent of Fairy Duelist from, uh, I believe, Ravnica Allegiance. And that card was pretty good in that format, although maybe for different reasons, because it was a 1-2 flyer in a world of 1-1 one -one spirit tokens. And the, uh, the comma trick half was also quite good for the Simic decks back then. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's still a cheap rogue for party synergies. It has flash, so plays well alongside counter spells. It's a rogue for those rogue synergies, and it mills the opponents to fill their graveyard for some of those synergies as well. And it still has that comma trick ability, so you do get a lot for just one mana. So, yeah, I like a C for the Duelist, but some decks might want it quite highly. Alright, and that's all the blue cards. Time flies when you're having fun. Our first black card, Acquisitions Expert, one on a black. For a human rogue add on common, it's a 1-2, and when the expert enters a battlefield, target opponent reveals a number of cards from their hand equal to the number of creatures in your party, and you choose one of those cards, and that player has to discard that card. So if Expert is the only creature in your party, they have to reveal one card and you discard it, so essentially the opponent chooses which card they discard, but as soon as you have multiple creatures in your party, you get more and more choice, and uh, potentially you get to snipe the opponent's best card. And two mana for 1-2 is still pretty decent, so... A good comparison is with a card like Burglar Rat, which was pretty good in its limited format, and this is also rogue for potential rogue synergies. So, yeah, I like Acquisitions Expert, probably give this one a C+. Then we've got Agadim's Awakening, X and Triple Black for a Mythic Rare Sorcery, that can also be played as a land that returns from your graveyard to the battlefield any number of target creature cards that have that each have a different converted mana cost x or less so this can potentially return a ton of different creatures as long as you've got a varied number of mana costs and uh, once again this is one of those lands that you can easily just uh, play as a land early on at the cost of 3 life to be untapped, or you can just play tapped and not have to pay any life. But then later in the game, let's say you have a total of 7 mana, x equals 4, return a 4 drop, a 3 drop, a 2 drop. Doesn't seem too far-fetched, and that is quite a bit of value. So, I think I'm okay giving Awakening an A. Does require a bit of setup, and you're going to be playing it as a land a decent amount of the time, but sometimes it just wins the game. Then we've got another spell land with Black Bloom Rogue, 2 and a black, for a human rogue at uncommon. It's a 2-3 with Menace, and it gets plus 3 plus 0 as long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard. So definitely a big difference here between a 2-3 Menace and a 5-3 Menace. But once again, we've got the flexibility of playing it as a land, so... Yeah, the rogue seems great. And in any deck that can reliably mill the opponent, it's gonna be even better. I mean, 2-3 menace is not too bad for 3 mana. So it doesn't need a ton of additional upside. And this has both upside of a land and the upside of potentially being a 5-3. So... Yeah, this is probably a B. Next up we've got Blood Beckoning, single black for a sorcery at common, and has Kicker for 3 mana, and you get to return target creature card from your graveyard to your hands, but if it was kicked, you get to return 2 target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand instead. A raised dead for 1 mana, and for 4 mana we get a double raised dead. So, yeah, nice bit of recursion in black, we're pretty used to seeing these at common, in uh, recent sets, and this is probably going to be no difference. 
It is nice that we have the flexibility of just playing it for one mana, but uh, getting the two creatures back is gonna cost four mana, which is maybe a bit more than we're used to. So overall, probably land on a C plus for this. Just a, a nice card that you usually wanna have at least one copy of in your black decks. Then we've got a blood price, three and a black for a sorcery at common. Look at the top four cards of your library, put two of them into your hand, rest on the bottom in any order, and you also lose two life. You do get a decent bit of card selection here and card advantage, but it does come at a price. A good comparison is probably to read the bones, which is scry to draw to, lose two life. This is I guess a little bit better than uh, Scry to draw two, since you get to look at four cards at once, but it does cost one more mana. So you can't play too many of these because it is slow and it does cost life, which you're eventually going to run out of. But having one of these is probably fine, so I'll give this a C. Blood Chief's Thirst is a single black for an uncommon sorcery and has Kicker for 2 and a black, destroying target creature or planeswalker with CMC 2 or less, but if it was kicked we can destroy any creature or planeswalker instead. So this is going to be premium removal in limited. Have the flexibility of playing it for 1 mana, but more often than not you're probably going to be kicking this for a total of 4 mana. So slightly expensive removal at 4, but it is unconditional. So I'm happy giving this a B. Coveted Prize is 4 and a black for a sorcery at rare. Costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party. And then you get to search your library for a card, put it into your hands, shuffle your library, and then if you have a full party you may cast a spell with CMC 4 or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So pretty expensive tutor effect if you don't have anywhere close to a full party, which is typically not what you want in limited. I'm not too high on coveted price. I think it's closer to a D than a C. But there will be rare occasions where this will be actively good. If you've got some unbeatable bomb that you want to search up, then of course it goes up in value. Deadly Alliance, four and a black for an instant. That costs one less to cast for each creature in your party, and it destroys target creature or planeswalker at instant speed. So this is probably going to be the premium common removal spell in black, and I'm pretty happy giving this a B. Demon's Disciple, two and a black, for a 3-1 uncommon human cleric. And when a Demon's Disciple enters a battlefield, each player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker. So that also includes yourself. It is a cleric, and clerics do have a bit of life gain and sacrifice synergy. Probably gonna see more of those sacrifice synergies in black. Edict effects are typically not amazing and limited, but you do have control over it, and uh, maybe you've got some additional synergy here. Overall, I'm not the biggest fan. Probably give this a C. Then we've got Drana, the last the blood chief. 5 mana for a 4-4 legendary vampire cleric at mythic. It flies, and whenever Drana attacks, defending player chooses a non-legendary creature card in your graveyard, and you return that card to the battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and that creature is also a vampire. So this card seems amazing. You do need to untap with it and attack with it before you get value, but it's also a 4-4 flyer for 5, which is not too bad. And as soon as you get to connect once, you already get quite a bit of advantage and it's just going to keep on getting out of hand if the opponent doesn't find an answer to Drana. Now it is still a 5 mana 4-4 with no special ETB effect, so it can be answered without you getting any significant value. And even just tapping it down will uh, prevent it from doing anything. So. I'm hesitant to give this an S rating, even though it is a card that can obviously snowball out of control. So I'm leaning an A, A plus for Drana, but it's definitely one of the scariest cards if it goes unanswered. Drana's Silencer, 5 and a black for a Vampire Rogue at common. When a Silencer enters a battlefield, target creature an opponent controls gets minus X minus X until end of turn, 
where X is the number of creatures in your party, and it's a 3-2 by itself. So pretty expensive. This is reminiscent of the Blight Breath from uh, Theros. And uh, yeah, it's not going to be too difficult to get minus 2, minus 2 out of this, since it's a rogue by itself. So as long as you've got a cleric, warrior, or wizard, it's going to be at least minus 2, minus 2. So this is probably a fine playable. It's going to be C in most decks. Some decks it's going to go up to a C plus, B minus, if you've got a full party. A Dreadworm, 4 and a black for a Worm Horror at uh, common. It's a 5-4, so pretty beefy for a black creature. And Landfall gives it indestructible until end of turn. Difficult to enable Landfall in the opponent's turn, so it's going to be mostly indestructible on offense instead of defense. Sometimes we would rather have indestructible on defense. But yet, yeah, seems like a fine curve topper. Once again, I do want to stress that landfall creatures that are expensive, the ones at 5 mana, you're probably not going to have a ton of lands left by the time you play this, so you're not going to trigger landfall as many times as some of the cheaper landfall creatures. But still, 5 mana for a 5-4 is definitely a solid board presence, so I'm happy enough giving this a C+. Expedition Skulker is one on a black for a Vampire Rogue at common. It's a 2-2 that has Death Touch as long as you control another Rogue. And some Rogues have Flash, so if the opponent isn't careful you could attack with this. They block with their 3-3, you flash in some uh, Rogue giving this Death Touch and you potentially get to trade up. And same goes on defense, opponent attacks with a 5-5. You put this in front, flash in a Rogue and all of a sudden you get to trade. So lots of tricky things that can be done with a Skulker, and as a baseline it's a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, so yeah, pretty happy giving this a uh, C plus as well. It's not going to be too difficult to get a few rogues, and a 2-2 two -two Death Touch is pretty efficient for 2-mana. Feed the Swarm, one on a black for a Sorcery at common. Destroy target creature or enchantment an opponent controls, and you lose life equal to that permanent converted mana cost. Don't often see enchantment removal in black. This is probably the second after Farika's Libation in Theros. Now, the life loss does add up, can be underestimated. So if you kill something that costs 5 mana, you're paying 5 life, which is pretty steep. Yeah, as long as you don't have a million of these in the deck, it's uh, probably fine to have a few. And then uh, it's a nice removal spell if you're in need of some removal. Probably not gonna destroy too many enchantments with it, but of course having the flexibility is nice. So Feed a Swarm. It is cheaper than some of the other removal spells we've seen, but it is sorcery speed and has a pretty heavy price tag associated. So I'm leaning C plus on Feed the Swarm, but definitely a fine card to have in any black deck. A Ghastly Gloom Hunter, one on a black for a zombie bat at common. It's a 1 1 Flying Lifelink, and it has Kicker for a total of 4 mana. So 6 mana to have the Gloom Hunter enter the battlefield with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. So 6 mana for a 3 3 Flying Lifelink. Pretty expensive, but very difficult to race. 2 mana for a 1-1 one, one flying lifelink is pretty annoying. So I like a C for the Ghastly Gloom Hunter, fine curve filler. And sometimes you'll play it on turn 2 if you've got nothing else, and sometimes you can draw it later, and it's going to be a pretty significant threat. Gouldras Mucklord, 2 and a black for a 2-3 crocodile at common. When it dies, you can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature you control. So very similar to the Centipede from Ravnica, but instead of a 3-2, it's a 2-3. So probably a bit worse than a Centipede, since a 3-2 tends to trade off more often than a 2-3. So I'll give this one a C. There is a bit of plus one counter synergy in black-green as well, so keep that in mind. Hagra Constrictor, two and a black for a 0-0 Snake. That enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. 
and each creature you control with a plus one counter on it has menace including the constructor itself so it's a three mana two two menace and it gives additional creatures menace potentially so yeah don't hate the constructor probably c plus and we've got another spell land with hagra mauling two and double black for an instant at rare costs one less to cast if an opponent controls no basic lands don't think that's going to come up in limited but then you get to destroy target creature so we can just evaluate this as four mana for a murder essentially but then we also have the flexibility of playing it as a land probably not going to play this as a land very often in limited unless you're mana screwed but uh yeah solid card probably just give this a b as well similar rating to what i gave the five mana common removal spell that can be reduced in cost based on your party so this seems kind of on the same level not sure which i would take pack one pick one highborn vampire three and a black for a four three vampire warrior at common and that's basically it so nice vanilla creature it's a warrior for those warrior synergies there's not a ton of warriors in black so this potentially fills that gap so very vanilla creature probably closer to a d than a c is my guess but uh could be a fine filler card inscription of ruin two and a black for a sorcery at rare so we've seen these inscriptions in the different colors so far and then kicker is two and double black we get to choose one but if it was kicked we get to choose any number instead between target opponent discards to return a creature with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield and destroy target creature with cmc three or less so overall i mean inscription of ruin is fine probably just a b b minus maybe a bit weaker than some of the other inscriptions we've seen but uh, if you ever get to 7 mana, it's usually good value, so fine card. Lithoform Blight, 1 and a black for an uncommon aura that enchants a land. When the Blight enters a battlefield, you get to draw a card, so it replaces itself. And when the land is enchanted by the Blight, it loses all land types and abilities and has the ability to tap for colorless mana. Or can tap, pay one life, and add one mana of any color. A pretty flexible card. You can use it to fix your own mana by enchanting your own land, but then it's gonna cost you a bit of life, turns your land into a weird city of brass. But you can also put this on the opponent's land to potentially deal them a bit of additional damage. So, pretty fun card to play with and uh, can potentially be a nice way to fix your mana in some multicolor decks. The downside is pretty low, just a 2-mana cantrip can never be too bad. Although I guess you'd potentially risk fixing the opponent's mana if they were splashing. So probably fine with a C+. Fun card to play with for sure. Malakir Blood Priest is a 2-mana two 2-1 two Vampire Cleric at common. And when it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses X, and we gain X, where X is the number of creatures in our party. Not too bad for a 2-drop, but again a 2-1. We've seen quite a few 2-mana two 2-1s two so far, so the 1-3s are starting to look better and better. But this could be a nice way to drain someone out in the late game if you're starting to assemble a full party. So, yeah, Priest probably just a C. Don't imagine this being much better than that. Then we've got another land here with Malakir Mire, which is the back half of Malakir Rebirth, which is a single blank instant and uncommon. We choose target creature, lose to life, and until end of turn that creature gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So, interesting little combo trick. Um, costs a bit of life. But it's pretty easy to keep up for just one mana, can maybe re-enable some enter the battlefield ability. Yeah, still have the flexibility of playing it as a land, so can't be too bad. Probably give this a C+. Marauding Blight Priest is 2 and a black for a 3-2 Vampire Cleric at common. 
saying whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life. Seems like a fine card. In the black-white cleric deck, you can maybe more consistently gain life to drain the opponent. But I still don't imagine it's going to be something that happens every turn. So I'll probably stick to a C for Marauding Blind Priest, fine filler card. Mind Carver is an uncommon equipment for just a single black. And we get to attach it right away, giving plus one plus so, or plus three plus one, as long as the opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, and then we get to move it for two and a black. So pretty cheap equipment to play. Very powerful effect if the opponent has a full graveyard, and the equip cost is still within reason. So yeah, I can dig the Mind Carver in a deck that can enable it. So C plus seems appropriate. Mind Drain, two and a black for a sorcery. Target opponent discards two cards, mills a card, and loses one life, and we gain one life. So a bit of an upgraded Mind Rot here. Definitely helps to mill the opponent if we're trying to get eight cards in their graveyard and having them discard two also puts a few additional cards in the graveyard. So in the Rogue Mill deck, this could be a nice role player, but still probably not more than a C. Nighthawk Scavenger, one and double black for a Vampire Rogue at rare. It has Flying, Death Touch, and Life Link. It has three toughness, and its power is equal to one plus the number of card types among cards in your opponent's graveyards. It's kind of like Tarmogoyf and Vampire Nighthawk had a baby. I mean, a pretty good card, especially in the uh, Rogue Mill archetype, where you get to fill the opponent's graveyards. What are the common card types and limited lands, creatures, instants and sorceries, and then if you get lucky, they have a couple artifacts or enchantments. So it's going to be trivial to get this up to 3 power, or rather to 4 power, since it's 1 plus those card types, if you've got some mill effects. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to get lands in the opponent's graveyard. But uh, creatures, instants and sorceries pretty easily end up in the graveyard. And 3 mana, 2, 3, Flying Death Touch Lifelink is just Vampire Nighthawk, and that's already an amazing limited card. So Nighthawk Scavenger easily gets an A from me. Very difficult to race, and can always just trade for the opponent's largest creature. And the mana Skitter Snake, or Sneak, is a 3-4 human rogue at common for 3 and a black, and as long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, the sneak gets plus 1 plus 0 and has menace. If this is a 4 mana 4-4 four, four menace, it's incredibly efficient, but some of the time it's just going to be a 4 mana 3-4, which is still fine. So this is somewhere between a C and a C plus. Yeah, I'll stay on the conservative side with just a C, but uh, in the right deck it can definitely go up to a C+. Plus. Although a 3-4 does line up pretty well against a lot of the 3 powered creatures we've seen. Then a Nemana Sky Dancer, 2 and a black for a 2-1 human rogue at common with flash and flying. And when it enters the battlefield, target opponent mills 2 cards. This seems great. Can get in some evasive damage, it has flash. And potentially mills the opponent at instant speed, which enables some of those uh, synergies that the opponent might not expect. So, yeah, we give some of the other two powered flyers for three mana a C. This is probably no difference. Null Priest of Oblivion, one on a black for a vampire cleric at rare. It's a 2 1 with menace and lifelink. That's a pretty good combination since it's. Pretty hard to block, but it needs to keep back multiple blockers to make sure we can get in to lifelink damage over and over. And then it also has Kicker for 3 and a black. And when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, we get to return a creature from our graveyard to the battlefield right away. Alright, this card seems pretty strong. As a 2-drop, it's totally fine, and then later in the game we get good value. So I'm pretty happy giving this B+, A-, minus, maybe even just an A. I'll, I'll go with a B plus on Null Priest of Oblivion, 
just a very solid card. Oblivion's Hunger, one on a blank for an instant at common. Target creature you control gains indestructible until end of turn. You get to draw a card, and if that creature has a plus one plus one counter on it, or rather you get to draw a card if that creature has a plus one plus one counter on it. Yeah, you really want the uh, plus one counter for this card to be good. Otherwise, two mana for indestructible is nothing special. So I'll give this a C, but in the Golgari deck with more plus one counters, it probably goes up in value. Then we've got Palaka Caverns, the backside of Palaka Predation, two and a black for an uncommon sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand, you choose a card with converted mana cost three or greater to make them discard. So kind of the reverse Inquisition of Kozilek. Two and a black is a little pricey for a targeted discard effect. But again, we get that flexibility. If we draw it late and the opponent's holding some removal spells, we can maybe get rid of them. And otherwise we can just play it out early on. Yeah, C plus is probably fine for this. Sign of the Swarm, three and double black for a vampire cleric at uncommon. And it's a 3-3 three, three flyer that says whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So another Ajani's Pride Mate variant. And yeah, in the black-white cleric life gain deck, this seems pretty strong as a payoff to eventually close out the game. Yeah, I like B for Sign of the Swarm. Do need to build around it a little bit, but the payoff is potentially pretty strong. Then Scourge of the Skyclaves, one on a black for a mythic rare demon. And it has Kicker for four on a black. When you cast this, if it was kicked, each player loses half of their life rounded up. And the Skyclave's power and toughness are each equal to 20 minus the highest life total among players. If we're both at 20, then this just dies right away. If you're ahead, then you sometimes won't even be able to play this when you're behind. That's typically when this is going to be... I mean, even if you're behind, if the opponent has a high life total, this can sometimes be useless. So there's a lot of scenarios where this card just does nothing. So I'm not a fan. I can definitely see scenarios where this just kind of wins you the game. It's also weird that it doesn't fly, because it kind of looks like it has wings. And it's a demon. This feels like a card that probably got fine-tuned a lot in developments and probably looked a lot different at the start and the end result is kind of a weird card that's maybe not great for limiteds. With the kicker saying each player, I mean it's still kind of a risk because you're also potentially dying on the swing back. So I'm still not a huge fan. Uh, probably give this a C, C+, plus. but it's definitely one of those cards that's gonna win some unwinnable games. Then we've got Shadow Stinger, two and a black for a 1-4 Vampire Rogue at Uncommon. Can tap another untapped rogue you control to give it death touch until end of turn. And when the Stinger deals combat damage to a player, that player mills three cards. The common scenario is probably you attack with this, and you've got an untapped rogue, and then the opponent has to decide whether or not they want to trade one of their creatures for this. And the fact that it can gain death touch means they probably have to at least double block the stinger and then you get to kill whichever the best creature is that's blocking it. And if they take it, then you get to start milling, which enables some of your rogue synergies and eventually can also just win the game by milling the opponent to death. And then it's only three mana for a one four. Plays defense quite well. You can still block with another rogue and then use the blocking rogue to give this death touch. So I like the Stinger quite a bit, C plus seems fine. Then we've got Shadow's Verdict, three and a double black for a rare sorcery. Exiles all creatures and planeswalkers with CMC three or less from the battlefield and all creature and planeswalker cards with CMC three or less from all graveyards. So all the small things are gone. Yeah, I mean, Limited mostly has 2 and 3 drops. So this is potentially a nice way to catch back up. 
and then kind of sand back some of your cheaper creatures that you get to play afterwards. This card seems okay. Doesn't get rid of the most problematic creatures. Although sometimes in the set you'll see uh, some cheap creatures with expensive kicker abilities that can still be quite problematic in the late game and Shadow's Verdict is still potentially a way of getting rid of those creatures that uh, could potentially be quite large despite having a low converted mana cost. Yeah, Shadow's Verdict. It's not as good as some of the unconditional sweepers we've seen in the past, but uh, it's still pretty good. Probably give this one a B and uh, we'll see where we land on this one. Skyclave Shade, one on a black for a shade at rare. It's a 3-1 that cannot block and we can also kick it for two in a black, and if it was kicked, it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it. So five mana for a five three. That cannot block and landfall. Says if the shade is in our graveyard and it's our turn, we can cast it from our graveyard. Doesn't have the typical shade ability to sink mana into it to make it bigger, but it does have kicker. And then it can potentially keep coming back from the graveyard. And a 3-1 does deal quite a bit of damage, the opponent eventually has to trade for it. And then you can still potentially get it back. So yeah, this card seems pretty strong. Probably give this one a B as well. Skyclave Shadow Cat, 3 and a black. For a Cat Horror at Uncommon, it's a 3-3. Three, three. 1 and a black to sacrifice another creature to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. And whenever a creature we control with a plus one counter on a dice, we get to draw a card. So this synergizes nicely in the black-green archetype. And, uh, you know, it's a fine sacrifice outlet and card draw engine potentially. 3-3 uh, three, three, for 4 is not incredibly efficient, and the activated ability does require a pretty big sacrifice. So I'm leaning C plus instead of a B, but in some decks it might end up uh, closer to a B if you've got a ton of synergy. Soul Shatter, two and a black for an instant at rare, saying each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker with the highest converted mana cost among creatures and planeswalkers they control. Now if this is an edict effect I can get behind, since it's typically going to get the most problematic card from the opponent, and it's doing so at instant speed. And also gets rid of Planeswalkers, which is a nice bonus. So, Soul Shatter, probably just a B. Fine removal spell. Although sometimes it will be worse than just a targeted spot removal spell. Subtle Strike, one on a black for an instant at common. This is also reprint. We can choose one or both. Between target creature gets minus one, minus one until end of turn. And put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. So this is also an important combo trick to play to play around and can be quite a blowout if you can get two trades in your favor. So this is definitely a combo trick that I like because it also leaves behind a plus one plus one counter. So you get some long-term advantage as well. So I like C plus for Subtle Strike, but it's not a card you want to play a ton of copies of. And you can also consider sideboarding it out if the opponent has seen it in game one. Then Taborax Hope's Demise, two and a black for a legendary demon cleric. It's a 2-2 flyer and it has lifelink as long as it has five or more plus one counters on it. And whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you can put a plus one counter on Taborax. And if that creature was a cleric, you may draw a card and if you do, you lose one life. What do we give? Taborax probably a B, B+. Plus. Takes a little while to get going, so it's unlikely that you're going to get to the lifelink mode. Thwart the Grave, 6 mana for an uncommon sorcery that costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party. So if you've got a full party, it's only double black. And you get to return target creature card and up to one target cleric, rogue, warrior or wizard creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So right to the battlefield they go. Yeah, it's a nice two for one. Assuming you have, let's say, two creatures in your party. Costs four mana to get two creatures back. And they go right to the battlefield. So 
This card seems pretty strong. Probably giving this a B, maybe even B+. Vanquish the Weak, reprinted. I think we've last seen this in... Was it Ixalan? 3 mana for an instant, destroying target creature with power 3 or less. So definitely a solid removal spell. Yeah, Black's got some competition at common, lots of solid removal spells. So do we give this one a B or a C plus? If I have to compare this to the 5 mana removal spell, probably prefer the 5 mana one. Although at some point, if you've got like 3 of the expensive ones, you probably want one of these before you want an extra 5 mana one. But uh, yeah, Vanquish the Weak still quite strong, C plus seems appropriate. And then we've got the uh, Blood Bog, which is the back half of the Zoff Consumption, which is a 6 mana sorcery add on common, making each opponent lose 4 life and you gain 4 life. So this one you're probably going to play as a land more often than not. But every now and then, the opponent's at 4 life, you top deck this and you can just win the game. Also gains life for any potential life gain synergies. So definitely a nice one to upgrade your mana base with. But uh, yeah, I imagine this one will be a land more often than not. And yeah, the art is a little disturbing. Not the biggest fan of mosquitoes. So we'll give this a C plus, And then I'm going to quickly skip to the next card so we don't have to look at the art for too long. And alright, looks like we've covered all the black cards. So now it's time to take a look at red. Akum Hellhound, our first red card. Single red for a 0-1 elemental dog with landfall, saying whenever land enters the battlefield under our control, Hellhound gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So essentially a reprinted step links, but the uh, color shifted into red instead of white. Now, step links, great constructed card where you've got fetch lands. In limited, it's a little different as we're not going to reliably trigger landfall twice per turn. So we're looking at mostly 1 mana 2-3, that uh, can only really be a 2-3 on offense, and uh, every now and then we might be able to trigger landfall twice, and sometimes it's just going to be an 0-1 that doesn't even get to attack. So I don't think Hellhound's amazing. In the hyper-aggressive landfall decks, this is going to be a nice role player but it's probably one of the weaker landfall creatures, since it doesn't get any permanent bonuses. So overall, probably give Hellhound a C, and only very niche decks are going to be interested in it. Your average red deck probably doesn't want it. Then we've got Akum Teeth, which is the back half of Akum Warrior. 6 mana for an uncommon Minotaur Warrior, and it's a 4-5 Trampler. Now this is kind of ideal for one of these creature uh, one of these creatures that can be played as a land cuz a 4/5 trample you know it's nothing exciting but if you're flooding out you'll happily take a 6 mana 4/5 trample and then you can easily play this as a land in the early game without feeling bad about it so yeah i like warrior quite a bit like if this is just a 6 mana 4/5 trample it would be maybe like a d maybe a c but the fact that we can play it as a land, I think makes this up to a C+. Just replace this with a land, and then instead of drawing a land in a late game, you're drawing a 6 mana 4-5 trample. But this is probably going to be played as a land more often than not. Ardent Electromancer, 2 and a red, for a human wizard at common, it's a 3-2, and when it enters the battlefield you get to add a red for each creature in your party. It's going to cost 3 mana, but you're going to get at least 1 red mana back. So it's a nice one to potentially double spell on turn 4, turn 5, and help you empty your hand faster, so it's a nice one for the more aggressive wizard decks, presumably. So, yeah, this one seems nice. Not quite Burning Tree Emissary, but it does have some similarities with it. So, Electromancer... Probably a C plus. I think this card's gonna overperform. Cinderclasm, one and a red for an instant add on common, and it has kicker for single red, 
and it deals 1 damage to each creature, but if it was kicked it deals 2 damage to each creature instead. So, kind of like an Electricery Pyroclasm mixture. And uh, yeah, I mean, 2 damage to each creature, there's not too many sweepers in Limited these days. And this one's at Uncommon, so you'll have to keep it in mind, and can be quite a blowout, so... Some decks are just gonna shrug it off, since they don't play many low toughness creatures. But in some other circumstances, this can be a one-sided sweeper, essentially, so... I'll go with a B for Cinderclasm, since it does have some blowout potential. Cleansing Wildfire. One and a red for a sorcery that destroys target land. His controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle, and you get to draw a card. So this is potentially a way for you to enable landfall twice by destroying your own land, searching up an extra basic, and triggering landfall. You get to draw a card, so the card replaces itself. And every now and then you can maybe try and, uh, and get the opponent's land with it, but more often than not, it's going to be used on your own land. Cleansing Wildfire in the Landfall Synergy decks is probably a fine role player, but we'll give this a C. Not many decks are going to be interested in it, so you can usually get it late. Expedition Champion Twin Arat for a Human Warrior at Common gets plus 2 plus 0 as long as you control another warrior. So 2-3 or 4-3, pretty big difference. So yeah, in the Warrior Tribal deck this seems pretty solid. Overall, probably land on C for the Expedition Champion. Usually still ends up trading off for an opposing 3-drop. Then we've got Fireblade Charger, single red for a Goblin Warrior at Uncommon. As long as it's equipped, it has haste. And when it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target, and it's a 1-1. So, strictly better Goblin Arsonist. Uh, yeah, this seems good. I mean, in a deck that has a few equipments, that is, or a few pump spells, maybe you can pump up the charger and take out two creatures on the way out. Uh, yeah, I like C plus for the Fireblade Charger. Seems nice in an equipment deck. Fisher Wizard, one and a red for a 2-1 Goblin Wizard. When it enters the battlefield, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. Yeah, nice uh, looting effect, although 2 mana 2 1 can potentially be pretty weak if uh, people start main decking all those 1 3s we've seen. So, there's also downside to discarding cards since you're filling your own graveyard, which can be bad against the blue black decks. So, keep that in mind as well. So, overall, Fisher Wizard probably just a C. Fine filler card at 2 mana if you need a 2 drop. Goma Fada Vanguard, 1 and a red for a 2-2 Human Warrior add on common. When it attacks, target creature an opponent controls with power less than or equal to the number of warriors you control cannot block this turn. So... Yeah, the more warriors you control, the better this ability becomes. And 2-mana uh, 2-2 two 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 is not a bad fail case, so C plus seems appropriate. Grotag, Buck Catcher, 1 and a red for a 1-2 Goblin Warrior with Trample. Whenever the Buck Catcher attacks, it gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn for each creature in your party. It is a warrior itself, so it attacks as a 2-2 Trample. And then it can potentially get quite a bit bigger. So I think Catcher might be one of the better 2 drops in red, at common at least, so I think this is a C plus. Grotank and Night Runner, 2 and a red for a Goblin Rogue at Uncommon. And when the runner deals combat damage to a player, exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card this turn. And it's a 2-3, so it can provide pseudo card advantage. And it says play that card, so if it's a land you can still play it, since it doesn't say cast. Otherwise you would be limited to casting spells. But yeah, you can also play lands. Now getting a 2-3 across for damage is going to be the tricky part, so that's where you're probably need, going to need the help of equipment like the the kite sail to give it flying or some other ways to enhance the runner, otherwise a 2-3 three for 3 is probably just going to get blocked pretty easily. Needs a bit of help, but can be a nice source of card advantage for a red deck. 
So I like C plus for the runner. Inordinate Rage, one in a red for an instant, giving target creature plus three plus two until end of turn and you get to scry one. Haven't seen a ton of pump spells, so this is one of them. Could combine nicely with that one mana goblin we saw earlier. And uh, yeah, scry one is also a nice upside to a pump spell. So this is fine, probably just give this a C. Can maybe combine nicely with double strike and white as well. Cargan Intimidator, one and a red for a human warrior at rare. Cowards cannot block warriors. It's not the first time we've seen that. And for one mana, choose one that hasn't been chosen. This turn between Intimidator gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Target creature becomes a coward until end of turn, so it won't be able to block warriors. And target warrior gains trample until end of turn. Yeah, the Intimidator seems like one of the best uh, two drops in the set at least. Who knows, might even see a bit of constructed play, two mana, three, one with some nice upsides. And overall probably worthy of a B. And then we've got another land here with Kazul's Cliffs, which is the backside of Kazul's Fury, two and a red for an instant at uncommon. As an additional cost to cast this, we have to sacrifice a creature. So going all the way back to the green-white rare we saw at the start, this potentially wouldn't be able to get cast with that creature in play. And then Kazul's Fury deals damage equal to the sacrificed creature's power to any target. So it's essentially fling for three mana, but we can also play it as a land. And fling is one of those cards that's is a little bit conditional in nature. Sometimes being able to just play the land half is nice. And then every now and then, if you've got a large creature, you can close out the game with it. Or if the opponent played a pacifism or some other enchantment to shut down your creature, you can still get a bit of value. So yeah, Fury's probably fine, C+. And I expect to play this as a land more often than not. Leyline Tyrant 2 and double red for a mythic rare dragon with flying, saying you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end. And when Leyline Tyrant dies, you may pay an, any amount of red, and when you do, it deals that much damage to any targets. Well, this card seems great. 4 mana for 4 flyer would already be worthy of a B, B. Plus. And then being able to store up your mana to set up a big turn with kicker or to just spend all that mana on uh, the ability when the Tyrant eventually does die. Seems quite strong. Of course, the worst case scenario is where you play this and the opponent can kill it right away before you manage to store up any additional mana. But usually you'll be able to get at least a turn, sink a bit of mana into it, and then if they take it out, you at least get to kill one of the opponent's creatures on the way out. So. Yeah, this might go all the way up to an S, just because it's a fine creature by itself. And then even if it gets removed, you can usually get a bit of value. And if it goes unanswered for a couple turns, it just wins the game. So I like S for Leyline Tyrant. I think this is the second S rating we've given. Magmatic Channeler, one in a red for a human wizard at rare. It's a 1-3, saying as long as there are four or more instant and or sorcery cards in your graveyard, Chandler gets plus three, plus one. So all of a sudden turns into a 4-4, four, four, and you can tap it to discard a card, exile the top two cards of your library, choose one of them, and play that card this turn. Yeah, this card seems pretty good. Can provide a nice bit of card selection. And, of course... The ability to discard cards also fuels the ability to turn into a 4-4 creature eventually. And a 1-3 I think lines up pretty well since it blocks all those random 2-1s we've seen. Yeah, I like a B, B plus for Magmatic Channeler. Seems pretty decent. Molten Blast, 2 and a red for an instant. That deals 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker or destroys target artifact. Haven't seen a ton of artifacts, but there are a couple decent ones at Uncommon, so it's probably gonna come up a few times. 
And then 2 damage for 3 mana, not the most efficient card, but we've seen a decent amount of 2-2 two, two flyers and 3-2s that this can kill. So I think C plus is probably fine for Molten Blast. It's hopefully not the best removal spell in red, but it's definitely a playable one. Morag, Fury of Akum, 4 and double red for a legendary Minotaur Warrior. Saying each creature you control gets plus one plus so for each time it has attacked this turn. And the landfall says if it's your main phase, there's an additional combat phase after this. And at the beginning of that combat, untap all creatures you control. You can potentially get multiple extra turns if you can enable landfall multiple times in your first main phase. Yeah, seems pretty strong. I mean, it is a six drop. So it's pretty pricey, and enabling landfall after already having spent 6 mana is not trivial, and it's not guaranteed that your creatures have great attacks. So could easily just be Morag as the only creature that gets to attack, the opponent just double blocks, trades, and that's it. And you don't get any additional attack steps, or, or maybe after Morag trades you get... Uh, a few extra attacks in with the creatures that didn't attack the first time around. I mean, the card's definitely good. I'm trying to figure out if I want to give this an A or closer to an S. I think I'm going to stick to an A. It's still 6 mana, and you're not guaranteed to get a landfall trigger. And uh, sometimes it's just going to be a worse Colossal Dreadmaw. So A seems pretty reasonable here. Next up we've got Nahiri's Litho Forming, X and double red for a sorcery at rare. Sacrifice X lands and for each land sacrificed you get to draw a card. And you may play X additional lands this turn. And lands enter battlefield tapped. So powerful way to enable landfall as a finisher. And uh, if you're flooding out this is an extra way to mitigate that a little bit. In, let's say, a normal deck that doesn't have a ton of landfall, this is probably like a C, C+. In a heavy landfall deck, this goes probably up to a B. So overall, probably give this a C+. A fine card, but I wouldn't take it. Pack one, pick one over a strong and common, necessarily. Pyroclastic Hellion, 4 and a red for a Hellion at common. It's a 4-5. When it enters a battlefield, you may return a land you control to its owner's hand. And when you do, the Hellion deals 2 damage to each opponent. Alright, so another way to re-enable landfall. And once you hit 5 mana, you're typically happy to pick up lands again. And then you get some free damage to boot. 4-5 decent stats. Yeah, I like uh, C for the Hellion. Definitely a playable card. A Relic Robber, 2 and a red for a rare Goblin Rogue with haste, it's a 2-2. And when the robber deals comma damage to a player, that player creates a 0-1 colorless Goblin Construct artifact creature token that deals 1 damage to the controller at the beginning of their upkeep and it cannot block. The Relic Robber is gonna leave some landmines on the opponent's side of the battlefield and that will slowly but surely win the game. So if this can connect once or twice, it's going to be very difficult to beat as you're just slowly going to die to those tokens. And it does have haste, so if you're on the play, then this can definitely be a very strong inclusion. Um, yeah, this card seems pretty decent, especially if you can give it evasion or equip it somehow. I like a B for Relic Robber. Rock Slide Sorcerer, 3 and a red for a human wizard at uncommon, saying whenever you cast an instant sorcery or wizard, deals 1 damage to any target, and it's a 3-3. Three, three. So yeah, dealing damage to any target is great. Can maybe combine this with a burn spell to take out larger creatures. And uh, sometimes you can just cast multiple instant sorcery or wizards in the same turn and take out some 2 toughness creatures. So it does add up. So I like B for Rock Slide Sorcerer. Great inclusion for the wizard deck. Royal Eruption, one in a red for a sorcery at common. 
Kicker costs 5 mana, so it's going to be 7 mana total then, to deal 3 damage to any targets, and if it's kicked, it's 5 damage instead. So this is looking like a pretty solid removal spell at common. It is sorcery speed, but it is 3 damage for 2 mana, which is quite efficient. Although 5 damage for 7 mana is a little on the pricey side. But still, having the flexibility is nice, so happy to give this a B. Roiling Vortex, 1 and a red for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of each player's upkeep it deals 1 damage to them. And whenever a player casts a spell, if no mana was spent to cast it, Vortex deals 5 damage to that player. I guess this was the anti-Fires of Invention uh, card. And then for single red, your opponents can gain life this turn. Alright, so in a very aggressive deck, this can shut down life gain and it will slowly also deal damage to the opponents. Seems okay, but uh, only a card you want in a hyper-aggressive deck. Scavenged Blade, one and a red for an equipment at common. Attaches to a creature right away, giving it plus two plus zero, oh, and then moves around for two and a red. So a solid piece of equipment. Gonna be nice in the warrior decks in red whites where you want plenty of equipment. So C, C plus, that sort of range. Probably C for an average red deck, but C plus for the warrior deck that has some equipment synergy. Scorch Rider, three and a red for a human warrior at common. Kicker for one and a red. When the rider enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, it gains haste until end of turn. So 4-3 for four, 4, nothing special, probably a D. But the kicker, giving it haste, makes it a little bit better. So I'll kick it up to a C. Shatter Skull Charger, 1 and double red for a giant warrior at rare. It's a 4-3 with trample and haste. And it has kicker for 2. If the charger was kicked, it enters the battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So then we're talking about a 5-4 for 5 mana, and at the beginning of your end step, if it doesn't have a plus 1 counter on it, you have to return it to its owner's hand. So this is reminiscent of the dash mechanic from uh, Cans of Tarkir. So 3 mana for 3 to kind of lava axe the opponent, and then can be a 5 mana 5-4 five with trample and haste that stays in play, which is still quite a beating. It's also warrior for any party synergies. So Charger seems pretty strong, happy to give it a B, maybe even B+. Shatter Skull Minotaur, 6 mana for a 5-4 Minotaur Warrior at Uncommon, costs 1 less to cast for each creature in your party, and it has haste, so let's say you've got 2 creatures in your party, then it's a 4 mana 5-4 with haste, which seems great. This is probably B-, minus C+, plus territory at least. Uh, red might have a bit more difficulty than other colors to get a full party going, since there's usually not too many clerics in red. But of course you can pair it with a second color that has more clerics and wizards. And then uh, it's not going to be too difficult to get a few creatures for the party. Then Shadow Skull Smashing is the mythic rare land sorcery in red. Deals axe damage divided as you choose among up to two target creatures and or planeswalkers. And if X is 6 or more, it deals twice X damage divided as you choose among them instead. And the casting cost is X and double red. So this is quite a beating if you ever get to a total of 8 mana or more. And even without it, it's still a nice mana sink in the late game. And then of course we can play the land for 3 life to have it enter the battlefield untapped. So Shadow Skull. Probably give this one an A, similar to the white mythic rare land. Those two seem like the best for limited. Sizzling Barrage. One and a red for an instant, dealing four damage to target creature that blocked this turn. So this strictly goes into an attacking deck. Can't use this defensively, really. So you have to be aggressive. In an aggressive deck, it's okay, but it's still not ideal. Kind of like Divine Arrow, where... Uh, the creature is still going to be blocking, so it prevents the damage from the creature that's getting blocked. So, don't love it. Pretty situational, but in a hyper-aggressive deck, if you don't have any other removal spells, this will do. So I'll give this a C. 
Skyclave Geopede to an Arat for an Insect at Uncommon. And it's a 3-1 Trampler, and Landfall gives it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So, turns into a 5-3 Trampler with just a single Landfall trigger. Yeah, that hits incredibly hard. If you're on the play, play this on turn 3, smash for 5. That adds up. Although, it does have a low toughness, so it's not too difficult to trade off for it but you're still probably going to take quite a big chunk of trample damage. So Geopete seems great. Um, C plus, B minus, somewhere in that range. I'll go with a B minus on Geopede, for starters. Sneaking Guide, single red for a Goblin Rogue. So, nice to have a Rogue in red since there's not too many. It's a 1-1, one, one, and for 2 mana we can tap it, and target creature with power 2 or less cannot be blocked this turn. So keep in mind, you can always use the ability on a creature that's 2 power, and then you can still potentially pump it afterwards, and it's still going to be unblockable. So that can be relevant with landfall. If you've got some party synergies, this could be okay if you need a way to break a board stall, this could do the job. Not particularly efficient, and a 1 mana 1 1 is nothing special. So this probably gets a D, but some decks might be interested in it. Then we've got another lands, which is part of Song Mad Treachery, 5 mana for an uncommon sorcery that gains control of target creature until end of turn. We get to untap it, it gains haste, so essentially Act of Treason for 5 mana but it can also be played as a land. So it's pretty pricey, but I think I'm still going to give this a C+, like I've done for most of these somewhat conditional spells that you're almost always going to be playing as a land, but every now and then the effect can be very impactful if you play it, so definitely worth keeping an eye on. And then Spikefield Cave is another land that's part of Spikefield Hazard which is just a single red mana for an instant at uncommon, dealing one damage to any target, and if a permanent dealt damage this way would die, it gets exiled instead. So very cheap burn spell. Can maybe play this in the wizard deck where you've got a ton of payoffs for playing instants and sorceries. On average, dealing one damage is not really worth a card, but of course having the flexibility here makes it better. Probably a C plus as well. I'm just gonna keep giving these lands a C plus. Spitfire Lagak, three in a red for a lizard at common. And it's a 3-4 with landfall dealing one damage to each opponent. Yeah, fine card. For the landfall deck, just a curve filler. Give this a C. Synchronized spellcraft, four in a red for an instant at common dealing four damage to target creature and X damage to that creature's controller, where X is the number of creatures in our party. So, decent removal spell, that also deals a bit of phase damage. 5 mana for 4 damage, not the most efficient removal spell in existence. So, hesitant to give this a B, but C plus seems fine. Teeter Peak Ambusher, 1 in a red for a Goblin Warrior at common. It's a 1-3, so it lines up pretty well against a lot of the 2-1s. And for 2 in a red, the Ambusher gets plus 2 plus 0 until end of turn. I always love these creatures that have an activated ability that uh, pump their power, and this is no different. So a nice early blocker that can maybe trade off, and then later in the game it's a decent mana sink that can apply quite a bit of pressure. So I like C plus for Ambusher, these cards typically overperform. Thundering Rebuke, 1 in a red for an uncommon sorcery, dealing 4 damage to target creature or planeswalker. Very straightforward. Uh, yeah, this is definitely worthy of a B. Seems uh, quite solid. Maybe even a B+, because it's so efficient, but it is a sorcery. Thundering Spark Mage, 3 in a red for an uncommon human wizard. It's a 2-2, but when it enters a battlefield it deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker, where X is, you guessed it, the number of creatures in your party. So at the very least it's going to be 1 if the Spark Mage doesn't die in response to the trigger resolving. 
And again, it's not going to be too difficult to get a couple of warriors in red. And then it can be kind of like a ravenous chupacabra in red. So a C plus at the very least for the Spark Mage, but it has even more potential in a very dedicated party deck. Tormenting Voice reprinted once again, so now we've got an extra piece of art to choose from. And yeah, Sorcery as an additional cost, you have to discard a card and then you get to draw two. So fine card, a bit of card selection is always nice. Although again, there's I guess the risk of putting too many cards in your graveyard, which can be bad against the mill decks. But uh, usually happy to have one or two of these, so I'll give this a C. And then Tuk Tuk, Rubble Fort, two and a red for a wall at common with Defender and Reach, giving creatures we control haste, and it's an O3. So pretty unique effect, don't often see this at common, uh, an effect giving all our creatures haste. So it cannot be underestimated. The sad part is that the creature type is just wall, so it doesn't have any party synergy. And an O3 is not the best blocker, we've seen quite a few 3 powered 3 drops that this won't be able to block, although then again it does have reach and we've seen a few 2 powered flyers at 3 mana. I'm probably still giving this a C since you don't want a ton of these in your deck, but it's definitely a playable card and uh, could potentially catch you off guard if you're not prepared for some hasty creatures. And then a Valakut Awakening to an Aret for an instant at rare, saying put any number of cards from your hand on the bottom of your library and then draw that many cards plus one. So it's card advantage neutral, but you get a bit of card selection. And then you can also play it as a land, so it has that upside as well. Falakut Stoneforge enters battlefield tapped. Definitely a bit better than some of the other spell lands we've seen, so I'm willing to give this a B. Nice way to refuel if you're drawing a few too many lands in the late game. And then Falakut Exploration is... Two and a red for a rare enchantment with landfall, saying exile the top card of your library. You may play that card for as long as it's still exiled. And at the beginning of your end step, if there are cards exiled with the exploration, put them into their owner's graveyard, and then exploration deals that much damage to each opponent. It's either card advantage or a bit of damage, as long as you can consistently enable landfall. It's a little bit slow at doing so, the damage is not a whole lot, but it's still better than nothing, I guess. Yeah, this is a tricky one to evaluate. Can potentially enable landfall multiple times, so that's potentially a way to deal more than one damage to the opponent if you didn't cast the exiled card. It also says play that card, so once again you can play lands out of exile. Probably receives a uh, C plus from me. It's a little slow to get going, but it will eventually generate quite a bit of card advantage. This one I'll have to play with to get a better idea. Wayward Guide Beast, single rent for a 2-2 beast at rare. It has trample, it has haste, but it does come with quite a weird drawback. When the beast deals combat damage to a player, return a land you control to its owner's hand. So you don't really want to play this on turn 1, although I guess you could play it and then just not attack with it. But it is an interesting way of enabling landfall for the aggressive landfall decks later in the game, although later in the game a 2-2 trample haste is not that relevant anymore. So I'm not really buying the wayward guide beast here, although I could see some exceptions where this could fit into a very aggressive red deck. But uh, I'll start out with a D for the guide beast and I'll be happy to be proven wrong. And alright, looks like we've covered all the red cards. And our first green card is Adventure Waits. One and a green for a sorcery at common, letting us look at the top five cards of our library. We can reveal a creature from among them to put into our hands, and the rest goes on the bottom. And if we didn't put a card into our hand this way, we get to draw a card instead. So we can decline to reveal a creature even if there is a creature, just to draw a card if we don't like the creature and just want a random draw step instead. So we can never really go wrong with Adventure Waits, and otherwise it's just a nice early cantrip to find whatever creature we're looking for. So yeah, just a C fine playable filler card. 
nothing special. Ancient, a green warden, four and double green for a mythic rare elemental. It's a 5-7 with reach, saying we can play lands from our graveyard. So that can potentially be nice in like a red deck where we can discard some lands and then replay them from the graveyard. And if a land entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent we control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So essentially doubles our landfall triggers, which can be quite strong. So already 6 mana, 5-7 reach is pretty decent. And then we get a whole host of additional abilities if we're playing against a mill deck. We can also potentially play additional lands out of the graveyard that the opponent milled, so that can also come up. So yeah, I'm a fan of Ancient Green Warden. Definitely an A rating. Next up, we have Ashaya, Soul of the Wild. 3 and double green for a Mythic Rare Elemental. It's legendary and... Ashaya's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands we control. And non-token creatures we control are forest lands in addition to their other types. And they're still affected by summoning sickness. Ashaya kind of has power and toughness equal to the number of lands plus creatures, since our creatures also count as lands. So Ashaya is going to be quite beefy, doesn't have any evasive abilities. But it also adds more mana, since all our creatures now can tap for mana. So if we're ramping into even bigger stuff, let's say we're playing the kicker deck, then Ashaya could potentially enable those synergies as well. So yeah, Ashaya is definitely a very large threat that has to be dealt with. So I like an A for Ashaya. Only seems fitting. Then we've got Balaged Recovery, two and a green for an uncommon sorcery that returns target card from our graveyard to our hands, and we can also play it out as a land instead. So nice recursive effect here. And yeah, happy to give this a C plus, maybe even a B, since effects like this in the late game can be incredibly valuable. But I'll, I'll go with a C plus, which is the rating I've chosen for most of these uncommon lands. Broken Wings. Two and a green for an instant at common, which destroys target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. A nice versatile sideboard card usually. Definitely a card you could consider main decking since it hits so many different cards. But uh, there's always the risk that you don't find any targets for it. And it's going to be rotting in your hand. But uh, this is close enough to main deckable that I'll probably just give it a C. But it's definitely an A tier sideboard card. So I'll go with a C for Broken Wings. Just prioritize it, especially if you're playing sideboarded games. Canopy Bailoth, 3 and a green for a beast at common. It's a 4 3, and Landfall gives it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So potentially a 6 5 on offense, which is pretty chunky. Yeah, Bailoth seems pretty strong. C plus seems appropriate. Crack played Bailoth. 7 mana for a 6-6 six, six beast at rare. Kicker for 2 and a green. And is uncounterable. Has hexproof and haste. So sadly we found our first hexproof creature in the set. And if the Bailoth was kicked, it enters the battlefield with 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. Well, at least it doesn't have trample. But Hexproof Haste, so 7 mana, 6-6, six, six. I mean it is expensive. And then kicking it is going to cost 10 mana, so that's probably not going to come up a whole lot. Otherwise it's a 10-10 with Hexproof and Haste, that's uncounterable. So it's an expensive card, um, but it's definitely pretty good in some matchups. Against some black Death Touch creatures it's not going to be great, but against most of the other decks it's going to be okay. So 7 mana keeps it from the A territory for me, but definitely a B. Powerful finisher if you can cast it. Dauntless Survivor, 1 and a green for a 1-1 one, one human warrior. And when Survivor enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. So essentially the Iron Shell Beetle from Ravnica, except it's a human warrior, which is even better because it has some implications for the party mechanic. 
So, fine card, C+, nice versatile creature that can either be a 2-2 or put the counter somewhere else. Happy to have this at 2 mana. Gnarlet Colony, 1 and a green for a 2-2 beast with kicker for 2 and a green. And if the colony was kicked, it enters the battlefield with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And each creature you control with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it has trample. This card seems great, 2 mana 2-2. Two, two. That still gives a trample ability, 2 plus 1 counter to creatures is great. Of course, black green is kind of the color pair where you've got the highest concentration of plus 1 counters. But even by itself, it can be 5 mana for a 4-4 four, four trampler, essentially, which is pretty decent. So, yeah, I like the colony quite a bit. This is kind of the high end of C+. This is a beast, so it doesn't have any party synergies like our previous common. But just uh, comparing the two, I would typically prefer the colony if I don't have any party synergies. Inscription of Abundance. One and a green for a rare. This is an instant. Most of our other inscriptions have been sorceries. So this is an instant for two mana and kicker for two and a green. And then we have to choose one. And if it's kicked, we can choose any number between two plus one plus one counters. Target player gains X, where X is the greatest power among creatures they control. And target creature we control fights target creature we don't control. So this can be quite a blowout if we can combine the two counters and the fight ability at instant speed. Can potentially take out multiple creatures from the opponent at once. Yeah, I think this is an inscription that I'm willing to give an A rating to. Whereas most of the other ones have been a B since they were pretty expensive and sorcery speed. This is only 5 mana to play all the modes. So happy to give this an A rating. Iridescent Horn Beetle for an green for an insect at uncommon. It's a 3-4. And at the beginning of your end step, create a 1-1 one, one green insect creature token for each plus one counter you've put on creatures under your control this turn. So this is going to be amazing in the black-green plus one counter synergy deck. And uh, it says one insect token for each counter you've put on a creature. And a lot of creatures just enter the battlefield with plus one counters. So if you don't have any plus one counter synergy, of course, you have no business playing the Horn Beetle since a five mana three force unplayable. But assuming you've got a few plus one counters in your deck, this card is going to be great. And it's going to very quickly get out of hand. So I like C plus for the Horn Beetle, definitely a synergy card. Juraga Visionary, 3 and a green for a 3-2 Elf Wizard at common. When it enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card. Those three words make any card playable, pretty much. And yeah, it's no different here. For mana 3-2, it's a wizard in green. Don't get too many wizards in green, so it's nice for the party mechanic. And it replaces itself, so yeah. Put Visionary in the card name and draw cards, and it's usually playable, and no difference here. So I'll give this a C+. Kazandu Mammoth, 1 and double green for a rare elephant. It's a 3-3 with landfall, giving it plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So very efficient creature, 3 mana 3-3, three, three, and a 5-5 five, five with landfall. And we can even play it as a land itself. So could maybe even have some constructed applications, who knows. But definitely a very solid card for limited. Does this get all the way up to an A? I think so. I mean, a 3-3 three, three and then a 5-5 five, five is no joke. And then we even have the flexibility of playing it as a land. So, yeah, it's not the most innovative rare, perhaps, but it's definitely a very solid one. Yeah, I'll give this an A. Next up, we have Kazandu, a Nectar Pot. One and a green for a 1-3 insect that common with landfall, letting us gain one life. So it's a very defensive creature, probably going to be used as a sideboard card against the hyper-aggressive decks more often than not. Maybe in like some green-white deck that has some overlapping life gain synergy. But uh, for the most part, I'm probably leaving this one in the sideboard, but every now and then if I need a filler 2-drop, this will do. 1-3 lines up pretty well against a lot of the 2-1s we've seen. So I'll give this a C, but it's probably going to be in the deck about half the time I draft it. Then we've got Kazandu Stomper, 5 and a green for a beast at common. 
and it's a 6-5 with Trample. Not quite Colossal Dreadmaw, but close enough. And when it enters the battlefield, return up to two lands you control to their owner's hand. So a nice way to re-enable Landfall later in the game. And it's pure upside, since you don't have to return any lands if you don't want to. Stomper seems great, nice curve topper for any green deck. C plus is fine by me. Calni Ambush to an a green for an instant at Uncommon. Target creature you control fights, target creature you don't control, so it's essentially prey upon at instant speed. But we can also play it as a land, which makes it very flexible. So this is an actual removal spell at Uncommon here. Although it is an actual fight effect and not a rabbit bite effect, so there's always a chance that your own creature ends up dying. So once again, I'm probably giving this a C plus because of the versatility. Then we've got Lotus Cobra, nice reprint, one on a green for a 2-1 snake at rare. And Landfall lets us add one mana of any color to our mana pool. It's a nice way to fix our mana and ramp. So Lotus Cobra, amazing card for constructed purposes, especially if you've got some fetch lands to go with it. For limited, it's still okay can help you ramp, but you're usually not playing more than one land per turn. So it's just kind of like a two mana mana elf that can also attack for two damage. So I'll happily give this a C plus, but I wouldn't overrate it just because it's a rare. Might of Morassa, one on a green for an instant. And it's a common giving target creature plus three plus three until end of turn. And if this is kicked, that creature gets plus 5, plus 5 until end of turn. Kicker is 2 and a green, so that's going to be a total of 5 mana. Pretty expensive to kick it, but you do have the flexibility. Not the most efficient pump spell at 2 mana, but uh, still playable. Probably a C. Just a fine trick if you want a trick. Going to be better maybe in the red-green landfall decks, where you can have some trampley creatures as well. Murasa Brute, 2 and a green for a Troll Warrior at common. It's a 3-3. So it's a center courser essentially, but a warrior for party purposes. So yeah, fine filler creature, probably just a C. Murasa Sproutling, 2 and a green for a Plant Elemental at uncommon. It's a 3-3 with Kicker for 1 and a green. And when the Sproutling enters the battlefield, if it's kicked, return a target card with a Kicker ability from your graveyard to your hand. So this one's pretty nice, definitely worthy of at least a C+. So this one doesn't have a relevant creature type for a party, but it does have a nice kicker ability to potentially provide a nice bit of value for the kicker decks. Nissal's Zendikon, 3 and a green for an enchantment aura, enchanting a land. And the enchanted land is a 4-4 elemental creature with reach and haste, but it's still a land. And when the land dies, return that card to its owner's hand. So don't really have the drawback of auras that you typically see of your creature dying and getting two for one since you get the card back. Potentially enables landfall again. And you can also strategically place this on one of those uh, lands that have a spell on the other side. And then if the land ends up dying, you can still potentially cast a spell later in the game. And yeah, reach is also a nice keyword to have since green can be pretty soft to flying creatures otherwise. So Nissa Zenicon, you do need to have 5 mana to attack with the land right away, otherwise it's going to be tapped. So still not amazing, but definitely a fine card, probably give this a C. Oran Reef Ooze, 2 and a green for a rare ooze. When the ooze enters the battlefield, you can put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control, which can of course be the ooze itself as well. And otherwise it's a 2-2. Two -two. And when the ooze attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on each attacking creature with a plus one plus one counter on it, which can include the ooze itself. So you can just play this as a 3-3 essentially. Attack, it's a 4-4, and it's just going to keep on growing. So it does get out of hand pretty quickly, and of course synergizes with additional creatures that have plus one plus one counters on them. Ooze seems pretty great. Of course, the earlier you can play it, the better, because then it's more likely to kind of snowball out of control. But B, B plus for the Ooze seems fine. Rabbit Bites. 
So this is reprinted as well, one on a green for a sorcery, and target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So this is typically the best common removal spell green gets access to. So I like B for rabbit bite, solid removal. Reclaim the waste, single green for a sorcery at common. Let's you search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand and shuffle your library. And if it's kicked for three additional mana, you get to search up two basic lands instead. So kind of like a lay of the land effect. So it doesn't ramp you, but it does fix your mana. So this is going to be a pretty important card for the multicolor green deck that I was talking about all the way back when I was discussing Omnath. And uh, yeah, this could be a fun enabler for some multicolor shenanigans. So I like C plus for Reclaim the Wastes. Not many decks are going to be interested in it, but the blue-green kicker decks and some multicolor decks splashing powerful bombs might be uh, very interested in this. Next up we've got Roiling Regrowth to an green for an instant and uncommon. And you have to sacrifice a land and then search your library for up to two basic land cards. Put them on the battlefield tapped and shuffle your library. So this can be a nice way to enable landfall twice at instant speed. And uh, yeah, putting a land in the graveyard could also potentially be useful if you can later get it back and cast a spell half of the land. And yeah, ramp is ramp, so if you're interested in ramping, this will do, and it also fixes your mana, as long as you've got the appropriate basic lands in the deck. Yeah, C plus seems fine, nice ramp cards with a bit of mana fixing as well. Scale the heights to an green for a sorcery at common, puts a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature, we gain two life and we play an additional land this turn as well, and we get to draw a card. It's kind of like Uro became a sorcery here. And yeah, scale the height seems pretty decent. A lot of different effects for a relatively cheap mana cost. I like C plus for scale the heights. Then we've got a nice one here with Skew Swarm, two and a green for an insect at a rare. It's a 1-1, one, one, but the landfall doesn't keep it a 1-1 one, one for very long, as we get to create a 1-1 one, one, green insect creature token, and if we control six or more lands, we get to make a token that's a copy of Swarm instead. So very quickly, we're gonna have a, literally a swarm of skewed swarms here, and uh, hopefully you've got enough tokens to keep track, because... Uh, yeah, that does get out of hand pretty quickly. It is just a 1-1, one, one, so it's not the highest impact creature right away, but uh, if it goes unchecked for a while, it will definitely take over a game. So, yeah, I like B, B+, for the swarm. Definitely a fun rare. Skyclave Pickaxe, to complete our cycle of equipment here. Single green, and attaches to a creature right away. And then it doesn't actually buff the creature by itself, but it does give landfall, giving the equipped creature plus two plus two until end of turn whenever we play a land. And then the equip cost is two and a green afterwards. So pretty interesting take on uh, a green landfall equipment here. And yeah, in the red-green or green-white landfall aggro decks, this is probably going to be a pretty nice equipment to have access to since it's just single green to play it, so it's very cheap and then it's not too expensive to move afterwards. But you do need to make sure you have plenty of ways to pick up lands again in the late game so you can keep enabling landfall. So overall, probably give Pekax a uh, C. It's a card that only a few decks are going to be interested in, but those decks are going to want it pretty highly, and it's probably going to be closer to a C plus in those decks. Spring Mantle Cleric for an green for an Elf Cleric at Uncommon. It's a 2-3, and when it enters the battlefield, it enters with a plus one plus one counter for each color of mana spent to cast it. So this is another one of those cards that wants to go in the multicolor green deck we were talking about. And yeah, imagine playing this for all five colors, then it could be a 7-8, which is pretty ridiculous. And just in a two color deck, this will pick up two plus one counters, so it's a 4-5 for five. Four five. But yeah, well, you probably want to be at least three colors before you play this, and then it's going to be pretty strong. And uh, yeah, it's also 
a cleric, which is a nice creature type for the party mechanic. So what do we rate cleric? I'll probably go with a C+, but again, has the caveat of only a few decks being interested in it. Which is nice for these uncommons, because that means that not many people are going to fight over them, and the decks that want them should eventually get access to them. Next up we've got Strength of Solidarity, single green for a common sorcery. Let's us choose target creature we control to put a plus one plus one counter on it for each creature in our party. So this is a pretty decent payoff for the party mechanic. If we've got three or four creatures in our party, this can be a very nice sorcery to have access to. It is a sorcery, so it's not going to catch anyone off guard. But uh, yeah, if the opponent doesn't have some removal spells that are ready, this will definitely inflict a lot of damage. Still not incredibly high on Strength of Solidarity here, it does require a bit of setup, and it does potentially have a 2 for 1 potential in the opponent's favor if they do have an answer at the ready, so probably still give this a D, but some party decks might uh, take this highly. Swarm Shambler, single green for a Fungus Beast at rare. It's a 0-0, but it enters the battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, and whenever a creature you control with a plus 1 counter on it becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, you get to make a 1-1 green insect creature token. So even if they try and kill the Shambler, you're going to get something in return. And then for 1 mana you can tap the Shambler to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So we've seen similar cards like this before, and they're typically pretty good and limited. Whenever you've got kind of a gap in your curve, you can fill it by sinking that mana into the Swarm Shambler, and it's eventually going to become a pretty sizable threat, and of course has some nice plus one counter synergies as well. So I like B for Swarm Shambler, maybe even a B plus. Just a bit awkward in the late game if you need to start growing it, and it starts out as a 1-1. Tajuru Blightblade, single green for a 1-1 Elf Rogue with Death Touch. And nice to see some rogues in green, since they usually don't get a ton of them. So, very helpful for the party mechanic. Great against any large green creatures or big landfall creatures that might otherwise deal a lot of damage. So, it's a nice defensive one-drop. These are typically pretty decent and limited, so I like C+. Tajuru Paragon, one and a green for an elf and a rare. It's a 3-2. And it also counts as a Cleric, Rogue, Warrior, and Wizard. Now keep in mind, it only counts for one of those at the same time. So having the Paragon in play doesn't mean you've got a full party. You still need three additional creatures with those types to get the full party, but the Paragon definitely makes it a lot easier. And then we can also kick it for three mana. And when the Paragon enters the battlefield, if it's kicked, we get to reveal the top six cards of our library and put a card that shares a creature type with it from among them into our hands. So of course that means Elf, Cleric, Rogue, Warrior and Wizard, so five different creature types. And then the rest goes on the bottom. So 2 mana, 3, 2, pretty decent already. And then it has a nice kicker ability and makes it easy to complete a party. So Paragon has a lot going for it, and I'm happy giving this a B, B+. Tajuru Snarecaster, 2 and a green for a 1-4 Elf Rogue with Reach, and that's it. So not the most uh, inspiring card necessarily, but again, having some Reach creatures in green can be nice to fend off any flying creatures. And then the Rogue creature types, useful for the party mechanic. So not one of the more exciting creatures, but it's still playable, so it lives somewhere between the C and the D. I'll uh, give it a C for now. Tangled Florahedron, one and a green for a 1-1 uncommon elemental that taps for green. Haven't seen a ton of ramp, and this is definitely a nice one, since we can also play it as a land. So if we don't need to ramp anymore, but maybe want a landfall trigger, this will do. The art is pretty dope as well. So I like C plus for the uh, Florahedron here. Seems pretty solid. Taunting Arbor Mage, 2 and a green for a 2-3 Elf Wizard at Uncommon. Has Kicker for 3 mana, and when the Arbor Mage enters the battlefield, if it's kicked, all creatures able to block target creature this turn do so. So combines nicely with Death Touch, if you can get a large Death Touch creature in play, it can potentially wreck the opponent's board. 
Fail case, a 3 mana 2 3 elf wizard. So, again, having a wizard in green is very useful for the party mechanic. So, overall, Harbor Mage decent, C plus seems fine. Territorial Scythe Cat is 2 and a green for a 2 1 cat at common. It tramples. I misread this. It's not a plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn, it's a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Yeah, that definitely changes things quite a bit. So, 3-2 after the first landfall trigger on turn 4. Yeah, probably a C plus then. It still trades off pretty easily, but uh, it does grow over time. So, definitely quite a bit better here. Yeah, if it was just plus 1 plus 1, it would probably be a D. But the counter bumps it all the way up to a C plus. Turn Timber, Ascetic. 4 and a green for a 5-4 Giant Cleric. At common, and when it enters the battlefield, you gain 3 life. So, Cleric, pretty nice to have in green. And 5-4 uh, that gains a bit of life, just a, a fine curve filler at 5 mana if you need something to round out your curve. But it's nothing exciting, so C seems fine. Alright, next up is Turn Timber Serpentine Wood, a land that can be played untapped at the cost of 3 life, as all the mythic lands are. And then the front half is Turn Timber Symbiosis, 7 mana sorcery. That lets us take a look at the top 7 cards of our library. And we can put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield. If that creature card has CMC 3 or less, it enters the battlefield with 3 additional plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. And the rest goes on the bottom. So 7 cards is pretty deep and we can potentially find a large creature and if we don't find a large creature the small creature still gets upgraded with three plus one plus one counters yeah definitely a solid card i don't think it's as good as the red or white mythic rare sorceries but it's still pretty nice to have access to if you're flooding out it's still kind of a an upgrade over a basic forest essentially i'll give this a b b plus definitely a nice addition to any deck Vastwood Fortification, single green for an instant, that puts a plus one plus one counter on target creature, but we can also play it out as a land, so again, flexibility is what makes this card so powerful. Once again, I'll give this a C plus. Then we've got Vastwood Surge, three and a green for a sorcery at uncommon, lets us search our library for up to two basic land cards, put them on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. And if we kicked it for 4 additional mana, so 8 total, pretty pricey. But then we get to put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on each creature we control. So that's quite the powerful kicker card if we can get to it. But of course getting to 8 mana in the first place is a bit of a challenge. And once we already have 8 mana, we're probably not super interested in getting to additional lands. Unless I guess we want to trigger a landfall. So a bit of a weird one, but... We're mostly interested in 4 mana, a ramp for 2, and fix our colors. Which, you know, some of the multicolor green decks might be interested in. So, I think I'm okay giving this a uh, C, C+. Next up, we have a veteran adventurer, 5 and a green, for an uncommon human. It's a 5-5, five, five, and it also has all those creature types within the party. And it costs 1 less to cast for each creature in our party. And it also has Vigilance, so yeah, again, pretty easy to get this out on turn 4 as a 5-5 five, five Vigilance. And then it makes any future party cards even better. So Adventure seems pretty strong to me. I think I'm willing to give this all the way to a uh, B. Seems like a nice payoff and enabler at the same time for the party mechanic. And then a Vine Gecko, 1 and a green for an Elemental Lizard at Uncommon. It's a 2-2, two, two, and the first kicked spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. That's a very useful ability. And whenever you cast a kicked spell, you can put a plus one plus one counter on Vine Gecko. So this seems like an amazing two drop for the kicker deck, which is mostly going to be blue green, but any green deck can kind of turn into the kicker deck. So Vine Gecko, yeah, I think I'm giving this a B. Just incredibly efficient and a nice enabler for any kicker shenanigans. And all right, looks like we went all the way around, back to the multicolor cards here. So yeah, overall, 
that looks like it definitely wants to pull you into the different synergies with, on the one hand, the warriors, the clerics, the rogues, and uh, then there's probably the landfall deck as well. So there's definitely a bunch of different archetypes. Just looking at the set, the multicolor green deck is definitely going to be a thing as well. Those are kind of the main archetypes, and then... Of course, it's always possible that you end up in a deck that's kind of a mixture between different archetypes. Maybe the party deck that focuses on getting the different creature types out there, which could also be kind of mixed up with the multicolor green deck. So definitely looking forward to trying out the set myself. And uh, for those that don't know, next week, I believe Wednesday, is going to be the early access event, which I'm invited to courtesy of Wizards of the Coast. So we'll be getting our hands on Zendikar Rising, can maybe do a draft or two, and then we'll mainly focus on the new standard as well, so we'll be brewing tons of different decks. So stay tuned for that as well. That's gonna be it for me today. Wanna thank everyone for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day. I also wanna thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.